Okay, we have a quorum. I'd like to call the, the January 18th public hearings for uh, proposed changes to the Berlin's land use and development regulations to order. Um, Tom, would you enlighten us? Brad, I'm going to have Brandy talk on these next three items. Okay. Okay, and I have a short um, PowerPoint here that I'm going to uh, run you through to walk through the changes. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and do that. Okay. So uh, the Planning Commission has put together some minor amendments to the zoning. Um, this was done to meet the statutory requirements and respond to the comments we got from state agencies when they reviewed the preliminary application for Newtown Center and for the neighborhood development area. Um, just as a point of reference, the um, statute uh, regarding the Newtown Center um, requires that the municipality have regulations that adequately control the physical form and scale of development. Um, that's been interpreted uh, by DHCD um, and the downtown board at this point to mean a form-based type of zoning. So uh, what we have done is to try to take a lot of what was in your uh, zoning that was adopted for the town centers district in 2019 and convert that over to a form-based uh, zoning district. And then the neighborhood development area has a series of guidelines that the town needs to meet. And that's for complete streets and building and lot patterns. So a lot of that has to do, has some, some specific requirements for, for roads and, and streets that we're going to see. So those are the two driving forces for these, um, these zoning changes. So the, um, the primary area where there are changes is in the town center zoning district. Um, and so it begins uh, with a new feature, um, this, uh, what we call the regulating map, um, in which the streets are colored here, as you can see uh, in different colors. So the, the, the pieces of the streets that are green, uh, those are what we're referring to as, as C streets those carry forward essentially the same dimensional standards that were in place uh, in the 2019 zoning. So it doesn't, uh, much of, of the change to the standards, um, it affects the other areas of the, um, of the district and these areas that are properties that front on these green um, C streets, the dimensional standards will be fairly similar to what they were um, previously. Uh, but what we did have to do to meet the new town center requirements is really to uh, make sure there's going to be a more block building form in this core of the, the uh, Berlin town center. So where you see the orange streets and the blue streets in the center, um, and what's now the mall parking lot and, and east from there, uh, that's the area where we're really trying to, to get to what we would refer to as a block building form. So buildings brought up to the edge of the street, multi-story, uh, covering a, a large percentage of the frontage of the lot. And then in, in conversation and uh, consultation with um, CVMC, um, we become much more familiar with what the specialized needs of a healthcare uh, campus are and what some of their um, concerns and issues around the zoning were. And we've made some adjustments um, that are reflected in the H street, um, which is the red street, um, and some of the other um, standards to accommodate their specific uh, needs, uh, which we'll see as we walk through here. So each of those different streets um, have a set of dimensional standards. And this is, this is what is characteristic of form-based uh, code is that it really lays out this series of dimensional standards, a lot of which you already had in place that are, tended, that are intended to, to produce a sort of specific form, built form at the end. So you know sort of the overall massing and size and shape and placement of, of, 
of buildings that's possible in the district. And so that's, that's how these are um, set up. The A Street says the highest density core area requires two stories. Um, buildings need to be brought up close to the street, uh, parking to behind them. Um, that, and then as you step down, the B Street is sort of the next most intensive um, with a one and a half story or, or 25 foot minimum height. Um, so you're getting a two, you know, you're not getting a, a low box building, but getting something that has the look of a multi-story building. Um, going forward, that C Street is, like I said, very similar to the standards you have in place now where the building needs to be brought fairly close to the street, but you could still get a, a row of parking in front. Um, setbacks and, and such are, are similar to what you've got now. And then these additional streets are, are meant for special uh, circumstances that may arise in as the Berlin Town Center area builds out. So the D Street is sort of a service drive um, something that might uh, provide access to rear buildings, um, things of that nature, sort of a minor access way. Uh, the H streets is this is the special um, frontage for the hospital. It also extends over to the state um, hospital property as well, and is really focused on the idea of sort of institutional um, buildings and their needs uh, on those healthcare campus um, parcels. And then the P Street is a, a pedestrian street. It's the idea of being able to create a, a plaza area, maybe something not to, too dissimilar to the concept of Church Street where um, the building's all front on a pedestrian uh, zone. There is one um, further revision that um, the Planning Commission is uh, recommending that you approve tonight that wasn't part of the package that you received. Um, during the planning commission hearing, we we had more discussion with uh, CVMC about building height and 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 to clarify how that will be um, regulated going forward. Um, we're now recommending that we add one more sentence um, to that description of building height that's highlighted here in yellow um, that says that buildings that are fronting on more than one street. Uh, the height will be for the primary street. So on a corner lot that clarifies which, if the two streets have different requirements for height, which, uh, which of those requirements the building would need to comply with. And then the next piece in the uh, proposed uh, zoning is, is some street standards. Um, these would be for new or reconstructed streets. There's probably not going to be a lot of those necessarily in the town center district. Uh, but if there are going to be new streets, um, in order to meet the program requirements, they need to have sidewalks. Um, on street parking needs to be allowed. Uh, generally, they're going to need to have curbs and street lights and street trees and that sort of thing. So this meets those NDA requirements, um, narrow travel lanes. So, um, promoting walkability and um, safe pedestrian access. And then uh, the, the section ends with architectural standards. Your 2019 draft included basically these, these underlying architectural standards. And what we've done now is to, to sort of expand upon them in terms of trying to provide examples with the images and some more uh, background guidance to determine that the um, Development Review Board can use to help determine whether um, what's been proposed meets those broad um, architectural standards. Um, both the new town center and NDA, the neighborhood development area um, programs do require um, some design elements in your regulations. We want to see that there's going to be buildings oriented to the street and to pedestrians that, you know, you don't have large swaths of blank walls, that there's regular patterns of doors and windows facing the street, um, and just generally supportive of, you know, interesting architectural detail, you know, architectural details, um, quality materials, uh, basically um, high quality buildings in the, in the town center that will last for many years and have lots of potential use and reuse opportunities. And so those go on, they go through um, 
you know, just various ways and examples of, of architectural approaches and details and designs, uh, materials. And then there is a, a list of other uh, minor changes elsewhere in the document. Um, there's a couple of different groups of these. So um, the three that are highlighted in blue, the language around non-conforming lots, accessory dwelling units and character of the area, those are changes that um, have been made in statute. Um, so there was some changes in state law that took effect last October. So those three just um, bring your zoning uh, in line with those changes to state law. This is one of the benefits of being able to have the select board make zoning um, changes that as state law changes, you can respond more quickly and, um, and make those adjustments and stay in line with those uh, most recently changed bits of statute. And then the pieces in purple and the one that I missed putting the purple highlight over the top of, these all um, are related to the changes that are made for the new town center and the neighborhood development area. Um, the state um, requested that you add some language about the official map to the um, regulations to make a cross <laughs> reference um, in order to to comply with the neighborhood development area um, requirements uh, there was some discussion of whether to make some adjustments to the dimensional standards of the zoning or to simply not allow for single family homes there aren't any uh, in the district and we don't really envision that anyone's going to want to build any there so the easiest thing to do is to remove the single family homes from the district as a permitted use, or actually they were a conditional use now. And these, the, the related um, accessory uses that go with, with um, single family homes. So the accessory dwelling, B&B, &B, et cetera. So taking those out. And then um, just some, some clarifying of language. So as um, the planning commission has been meeting and talking and looking at these and, and making the bigger changes to the zoning district. Uh, there's just been some need to do some clarification and, and making, and lots of this is around um, vehicular things. So parking, just cl cleaning up and clarifying the language that's already there. Um, access and circulation and the design and layout of necessary improvements. Those relate to just making it more clear um, the definitions and the and how those will be applied with regards to driveways and roads. You see that in the definitions too, um, cleaning up those definitions of driveway and road and, and cross-referencing back to the sections that regulate them. Um, and then there's uh, a, a request from the Development Review Board to add some new language to the waiver and variance section. So um, adding a new criteria for waivers for that the proposed development cannot be reason, reasonably located elsewhere on the lot. And then after the planning commission hearing, there was also a request to um, make one of the criteria that's already in the regulations that's relevant and, and, and required for variances, but isn't right now for waivers, also applicable to waivers. So that's the, that would be something that um, you guys would have to approve as an addition and an amendment to what um, is in front of you to also um, add that piece. And then the definitions, these are most, are, are just again, clarification um, that we had in the discussion. So there wasn't a definition of reconstruction um, in the regulations, the term was used. Um, we've added that discussion around whether resurfacing of a parking lot was with maintenance or was that going to trigger need for changes um, to conform to the new rules and things like that. So. It's all about cleaning up that language. And that is the end of the updates to the zoning regulations. Let me unshare my screen. Okay, that's all I have on the presentation side. Any comments on it? None from me. No. Nope. Anyone else? 
Um, let's see here. I guess uh, your motion to close this hearing, this section part of the hearing. Yep. I make the motion to close this hearing. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Aye. Motion uh, approved and uh, hearing number two. Excuse me, Brad. Oh. Uh, can we can now the board just take action on what was presented okay. and and accept the the proposed uh, amendments and the two items, the two new items that were presented for the board's consideration tonight. This is different than what I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, a motion, a motion to, to approve those changes as presented by Brandy and also reiterated by Tom Badowski just now. Your I'll second. second. Yep, I'll uh, second. Any further, any further discussion on this? Thank you, Brandy. Yep. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, Motion carries. Uh, let's see here. And now hearing number two, the official map for the town of Berlin. Anything on that, Tom? Randy, are you gonna share your screen? Um, yes, but do you wanna, do they need to do a motion to open the hearing? Oh yeah, they're right. Yep, Brad, you need a motion to open the hearing. Sorry. Here, here a motion to open the hearing number two for the official map of the town of Berlin. So moved. Here a second. A second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries in the official map for the town of Berlin. Brandy. Okay. So the good news is that this is even a shorter presentation. So pull this back up. So just as a point of clarity and for the record, um, Berlin's adopting an official map is a requirement uh, to seek a new town center um, designation. So um, the official map is something that's laid out in statute um, that sets up the authority for towns to, to adopt. Um, this is the map that is promote, proposed. It primarily focuses on the new town center area, but it also shows um, existing uh, public facilities and, and infrastructure and utilities um, throughout the entire town. It is a town-wide um, document. Uh, if we zoom in here to the town center area, um, you can see it's showing um, the existing things, but also here um, you're starting to see um, planned sidewalks, um, streets, things of that nature that um, are showing up in the, um, in the in the town center area um, that are following the the work that we've been doing laying out and Paul is on the, the meeting here tonight, the design work that's been done um, to suggest how to, 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 to put a new road alignment in uh, in front of the mall um, to create that um, street network necessary for the new town center. Um, there is a small change to this map um, versus the one that um, you looked at before and I think you might have um, if you have the version that the Planning Commission looked at. Um, and that is to, to take this area in here, and I think I haven't put this up to full screen so that you can see here where I'm. So this block in here, because of uh, the work we've now gotten done that has delineated the wetland um, areas in the, um, Berlin Town Center area, we know that we can't go as far east as deep into the property as um, we once thought was possible. So this has gotten uh, shortened up and the block has been uh, reduced basically in half here so that there, there's a small change 
to this core area right here. So that being said, let me get back here. That is the official map um, ready for you to have discussion on. We hear any discussion? What is this? What does this mean if we adopt this as the official map? What are the drawbacks to it? So um, adopting an official map, it, it gives the municipality a tool that it can choose to use in the future. Um, so the areas that are shown, say, where there might be proposed to be a street or a sidewalk or a public park, um, should the owner of that property want to develop it, the official map gives the town the ability to purchase that land um, instead. Uh, it doesn't give you the ability to take it, uh, you know, through eminent domain or something of that nature, but to, to purchase it. Um, it. It's kind of equivalent to the idea of a right of first refusal um, in a way. It, most municipalities who have them in, don't, in Vermont don't use them to, they didn't, the, the, to that extent. So what typically happens is that a development project comes forward, it's on a property where there is a feature that's on the official map, um, say a sidewalk you know, is shown. Uh, what really is in the town's interest is that the sidewalk sort of begin and end at the edges of the property, roughly where they're shown on the map, so that over time a connected you know, sidewalk network will emerge. But the town is usually a little more open to discussion around where within that property the sidewalk goes as long as it begins and ends where you need it uh, on the edges of the property so that it can connect in, to adjoining properties. And so typically, and that's the case with streets and other utility corridors and, and pathways and things like that as well. So typically, um, you know, the, de the developer, property owner, applicant, um, and the town would negotiate and come up with a mutually satisfactory outcome that both achieved uh, the development opportunity and um, preserved and created the, the connections and corridors that were anticipated by the official map. It just gives you a little bit more legal uh, standing and, and, and so, some, some, an additional tool to use um, in that negotiation. And this is required? It is a requirement to have the, um, the designation. Um, how do you change the map if, if down the road, Brandy? Just like you're doing tonight. You can at any point amend the map. You would have a hearing process and, and amend the map. Okay. So it's not it's not like it's set in stone. It's it's still a flexible document. It's it's flexible. Um, all of these elements that you're looking at tonight that you're doing hearings on, you have the ability to to amend in the future. And in, I mean, it actually is anticipated that you likely will. Um, that over time, you know, you're going to get more information. Um, you know, maybe like with your utilities, as the water and sewer infrastructure builds, you know, you're going to add more information to the map uh, there. Or as you do some scoping studies and you actually come, come in with a final alignment for a road or a path or a sidewalk, you may want to adjust the map going forward. Okay. Anything else on this? Any questions? Is there a motion? I make the motion to approve the official map of the town of Berlin as presented by Brandy Saxton tonight. Excuse me, Flo, we need to close this hearing first. We need to close this True. hearing first. True. Okay. I make a motion to close this hearing. Second that. And uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, motion carries. And now, Flo? I make the motion to approve the official map of the town of Berlin as, a, as presented to us tonight by Brandy Saxton. And thank you, Brandy. Here's a second.
I'll second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, opening the public hearing for the capital improvement program. And a motion on that. I make a motion to open the hearing, hearing number three for capital improvement program discussion. Here a second. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Brandy, capital improvement program. Okay, final piece of the presentation. Okay. So once again, having a capital improvement program is a requirement <laughs> uh, for Newtown Center designation. Uh, it is something that is in statute um, in 4430 and 4443, um, telling you both what um, is to be in a capital um, budget and a plan, and then how to go about um, adopting it. So there are eight capital improvement projects um, in this, um, I refer to as a SIP, a CIP, um, that are planned for the Berlin Town Center. Um, it does focus on essentially the Berlin Town Center area. So those eight projects, um, municipal building, what we're calling the Center Street Project, which is the realignment of the Berlin Mall Road, um, the Town Center Path, uh, Town Green, um, stormwater and wetland mitigation. Uh, knowing that you're going to be looking at the street and the pathway, um, those are aspects that would definitely have stormwater and wetland um, impacts and issues to be resolved. So there's a, a, line, a line on for that. There's uh, projects for municipal sewer and water, obviously, since those are infrastructure projects you're already engaged in. And then I don't think this was in the draft that you saw uh, previously um, when we came in and, and, and presented the drafts um, because VTRANS in looking at the drafts requested an addition, um, which would be uh, some, some looking at the Route 62 intersections at um, Fisher Road and at uh, Payne Turnpike. So we've added an eighth project there to address that request. So um, the, the capital improvement program is set up so that it has your current fiscal year and then five fiscal years out. So looking between FY21 and FY26, um, it, it's a fairly um, discrete set of things that um, would be envisioned in that six year period. It's more like five and a half at this point. Um, but the municipal facility needs assessment, which um, you guys uh, supported the grant application for. The town didn't get that grant, but it's something you would be continuing to look for funding to move forward with. And then I think um, Tom has actually been exploring some potential funding sources for these scoping studies for the street improvements and the multi-use path. So those would be sort of the next steps for both of those projects. And then you've, the water and sewer projects that you've been working on would be completed out. And then you have debt service that goes forward that shows up in the um, capital improvement plan. So really having the SIP is, is demonstrating that you have an ongoing commitment to capital planning and budgeting. Um, the one important thing to remember is that it's not a budgetary commitment, it's a planning tool. So putting something into the SIP doesn't mean that you have obligated the money. Um, it's, you still have to go through your budgeting process and, and get, your, get those, um, those line items into the actual budget. Um, but you should sort of incorporate this capital improvement um, planning into your regular annual budgeting process. And as those various need assessment and scoping studies are done, there'll be more detailed project costs and information that you can incorporate into the SIP in future years. Um, you could also expand it 
Uh, right now it's really focused on the Berlin Town Center, but you could expand it in future years to include all capital spending for the town. So for instance, road projects townwide could get put into this, um, this document as well. So um, there are, I've got the first couple of pages here. Um, so the first two pages of the SIP um, lay out the overview and in putting together the presentation this afternoon, I found a math error. So it's always good to, to do one more check at the math and realize that your numbers don't add up. Um, so the things that are circled, there was a, um, there was a, a math error in project seven, the water systems improvements that sort of flowed through literally uh, the rest of the spreadsheet. So the numbers that are different than the numbers um, that you're looking at uh, are circled here. Um, but there wasn't really a, it was just a, a, a spreadsheet error here. So this lays out the expenditures. So those eight projects, the, the years. So you've got, um, and I'm gonna take this out of this view and go back to the view so I can point at things. Um, you've got the first column is, is in here to help indicate that the town has already put a significant investment into the Berlin Town Center. So in terms of this being uh, a useful component of the um, application, this really demonstrates that you have put a fair amount of money already in to the um, infrastructure in the Berlin Town Center. So this is your current year and then the five years out. And then um, because so much of what needs to be in here is still unknown, um, you don't yet know what the project costs and timelines are gonna be for a lot of those, those elements. Um, this column was added in where we look out beyond that five year window and just ballparked in some rough ideas. So you might have some sense and there really isn't a good idea yet of, of what the funding sources might be for some of that um, and, and who would actually um, implement all of those. Some of that work might be done in conjunction with private development. Some of it might be um, town work. Um, so that would all still remain to be, to be known. And then in terms of funding, um, that's the second page. It goes over, I mean, right now you've got your general fund. You've got the potential to, to seek grant funding for projects. Uh, you have um, debt, you're taking on bonding. And then the enterprise funds, those are the actual revenues from your water and sewer departments. Um, there may be other uh, funding sources in future years that you would pull into this um, with getting your designations, you might have access to other funding uh, opportunities. So whether that's a special assessment uh, district or it's a TIF district, or you decide to move forward with an options tax to, to, to uh, use towards some of these projects, those are all future decisions to be made that might get incorporated into the SIP in future years. And these circled numbers are still the problem with the water project um, that I found today. And so adjustments to those those sets of numbers. And then just so you can see the water project, and this is what each project obviously has its own page like this where you're looking and breaking down in greater detail what's going on with that project. Um, this, the, there was a, a, a misad over here in this column and then the, the 190 from up here didn't get put down here. And so costs and revenues were not balancing which is not good in budgeting. Um, so we fixed that and it's going through there now. <clears throat> so that's the end of that uh, portion of the presentation. If you have questions. Thank you for the presentation and for finding those discrepancies and making amends appreciated. Any other comments on this? Hearing none, a motion to close the hearing. I make a motion to close this hearing, number three. Your second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. And now uh, motion to approve. I make the motion approval. to approve. The capital improvement program as presented by Brandy this evening for the eight capital improvement projects plans for the Berlin Town Center. 
there a I'll second? second? Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Um, we will now. Brad, there's three other items that you folks need to take up here before you move to your regular meeting. They are, Brandy, you have a copy of those handy real quick. Yeah, I can um, pull up. So the first is the community investment agreement. Is that where, I don't have the list in front of me, so I don't know what order you put them in, Tom. I think that was last. Oh, that was last. What I was think, the first I think, I think the resolutions of support were the first of the okay. NDA. So, so to submit the two applications, we actually need resolutions uh, from the select board authorizing the submission of those. Um, so let me grab those here. I forgot to open them up ahead of time. My apologies. And they were sent in to, in advance with, yes. with the select board members. Yep. So those are just, um, here's the one for the NDA. There's one for each application and they do need to be done uh, one for, for each. Uh, let me share my screen again. They're very similar to one another, um, but basically uh, you are authorizing the submission of the application. Um, with a bunch of, so this is the, the neighborhood development area one um, to support the application that needs to be changed to neighborhood development area. Thought I had changed that one. Um, and then the one for new town center. can now see how many files I've created in the production of the applications. That's this one here. So this is the very similar one for the new town center, um, basically authorizing the submission of the application and, and supporting it. Okay, uh, motion to approve the resolution authorizing the application for a neighborhood development area designation. So moved. Here a second. Second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Flo, did you approve? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, let's see here. Now, motion for the resolution authorizing the application for a new town center designation for the town for the Berlin Town Center. Also, so moved. Your second. Second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, and we are now done with the. No, we have one, one more. One, one more, more, which is the community investment um, agreement. This. Um, and let me share my screen back. We talked about this in its draft form and nothing has um, changed with it. Um, we are in the process of getting the property owners um, to, to also sign on this. And um, I can probably announce that you're not going to be the first signatories. We actually um, got um, the auto dealership, uh, so Dave, uh, I'm just going to Birmingham. Birmingham. <laughs> Birmingham. Birmingham um, has signed off and sent me his this afternoon. So you're, you would be second in line to uh, sign uh, on to the um, 
community investment agreement. It's um, this is a requirement for the neighborhood um, or for the new town center. Sorry, um, you're basically affirming your commitment and willingness to participate in the activities and programs that will support and enhance the economic and social health and viability of the area proposed for new town center designation. And then um, agreeing to commit and par to participate in planning for and developing the Berlin Town Center into a central business district for the community composed of compact, pedestrian friendly, multi story, and mixed use development that is characteristic of a traditional downtown, supported by planned or existing infrastructure, including curb street with sidewalk and on street parking, stormwater treatment, sanitary sewers, and public water supply. That's the definition of a new town center that's in statute. So that's the resolution. Hear a motion of the community investment agreement for the Berlin Town Center. I make a motion to approve for the community reinvestment agreements for the Berlin Town Center. Second. Yep. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Hello? Aye. John? I, yep, I. Oh, sorry. Yep. Okay, motion carries. Um, I don't find that, any more paper. I don't find any that, more that, paper. That, this. No, that ends this portion of the, okay. of the agenda. So I want to thank the select board for, for their time and effort in this. It's It's been a, you know, a, a process that, um, and we're just soon to submit our our applications on both of these, uh, full applications of both of these initiatives. So it's very exciting times for the town of Berlin. So thank, thanks to the select board. Okay, um, with the hearings closed, um, we will now start the regular public, uh, uh, the meeting of uh, January 18th for the Berlin Select Board. Uh, additions or changes to the agenda, Tom? Uh, Brad, I sent out to the select board today a change, and I put it in right after um, uh, 750 uh, discussion on the town clerk budget. And I think that's everybody has that. I could I could share my screen if they need to see. Okay. I I think we should also add an item about uh, uh, how we made the vote for the change to Australian ballot. Um, I think we may need to take action on uh, the discussion piece uh, as far as holding the public hearing, because as far as I recall, we opted not to have a public hearing. So we're gonna have to have a discussion on that as well. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see here. Before we go any further, um, let's see here. Um, with us tonight is uh, Flo Smith, John Quinn, um, Justin Lawrence, Angelina Caprone, and myself. Um, with us also is Tom Badowski, an acting administrator, and Diane Isabel, our treasurer. Uh, any public comments? Hearing none, treasurer's report, Diane. Uh, no, I don't have anything here. Uh, I guess the rest is in the agenda. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, seven, uh, Berlin Conservation Commission. I believe Phil's on the call. I saw his name here. I am on the call and okay. We would like to take a few minutes uh, to present some findings we had on the survey and I'll let Wendy take over from here. Uh, she's done some wonderful uh, uh, correlating of the, uh, collating co of the uh, survey. So let's, Wendy, are you? Yes, I'm ready, hi. Um, 
we decided to use a survey as one tool that we wanted to use to gather information. Um, we were interested in um, learning from Berlin residents um, the level of support for a vast trail um, to understand if there's any concerns and also to solicit possible solutions from people. And then secondly, we wanted to gather the same type of information from people who visit the forest from out of town. Um, if um, the select board does choose to um, vote yes on the vast trails, um, we will need to update our management plan. And part of that process would include addressing some of the concerns that may have come out of the survey and documenting um, the solutions to those um, concerns. And I wanted to sh um, quickly share some of the results we have and see if there's any questions. And I'm going to try to share my screen. You have that capability. What's that? You do have that capability. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we chose to look at three different questions in more detail of the multiple choice questions. Um, the first one was how often do you visit the Berlin Town Forest? And we divided it out um, between people who lived in Berlin and people who live out of town. Um, and as you can see at the top is Berlin. This blue area indicates people who um, visit the forest at least once a month. So we have 11% of Berlin residents visit almost every day, 19% who responded to the survey um, visit at least once a week and 23% visit at least once a, once a month. So that's a total of 53% of the respondents who visit at least once a month. Um, we also had another 32% who visit a few times a year and then 16% who visited rarely or never. And if you look at the out of town respondents that we got, we had um, about 16% who visited once a month or more. Um, 55 said they visited a few times a year and 29 of the respondents from out of town said they rarely or never visited the town forest. So that gives a little indication of use, who's using it, how frequently are they using it. Um, when we go into the second question, which was, um, would you like to see the existing trail um, for Brookfield Road to the top of Irish Hill widened and groomed for snowmobiling. If we, I'm gonna look at the out of town first this time. Um, we had 75 respondents from out of town. 95 of those said, yes, they would like to see um, vast trails added onto the existing trails. We had four no responses and all four of those no responses were from Northfield. Um, the location of this group, we had some surrounding towns, but we had people from as far away as like north of Burlington, Middlebury, one out of Stater. Um, so we had quite a range of where these responses were coming from. If we look at Burlington, Berlin, um, for um, 40, let's see, what is that number? 45% were no or leaning no um, to add the Bass Trails in. And we had 41% who were yes or leaning yes. And 14% who needed more information. And just to drill down on this just a little bit, for the ones that were leaning yes from Berlin, if we went on to the second question was, how comfortable were they sharing trails? Um, there were five responses who were leaning yes. One person did not visit the forest. Um, one person was not comfortable sharing trails. And we had three who were maybes. And it depended on things like um, enforcing speed limits, um, having non-snowmobilers have the right of way, and signing an education. And to drill down, I'm gonna drill down in this section also, needing more information. There were six people who needed more information. Um, 
when we asked them about sharing trails, um, one was not comfortable due to speed and sound. One was comfortable, didn't give any comments. And four were maybes. Um, one of the four would be comfortable if there were separate trails for snowmobiles in non-motorized use. Um, there were some concerns about wildlife impact. Um, there was an abutter who had some concerns and there was one person who felt like he didn't have enough information. Can we, if we go, I'm sorry. Go I ahead. just wanted to back up on that real quick. Can we go back to that last slide? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I had sent a, a request and I know I, I, I didn't. I have Justin, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Sorry, I had sent a request to get some additional information and I apologize. Um, if I didn't reply, it sounded like these surveys were confidential um, and I completely respect that, I think, obviously. Um, what I was trying to gather for data, um, because I, I, what I was trying to do, and I don't know if you folks were doing the same thing, but I wanted to merge a, a lot of the information that we had here um, and, and gather, because as we know, people, they don't always respond to a survey or they may respond to an email. And I know that we had several, uh, a bunch of residents that were in support of it, much more than the 59 that we pulled. So I wanted to just kind of cross-reference and pull those people out. And is there any way that we can do that um, so that we can get the actual percentages? Because I know a tremendous amount that weren't involved in the survey were in support. And there were probably some that had additional follow-up questions and details like that, but I'd really like to merge both pieces of data. And I, so, I really, um, so they were not able to fill out the survey? Well, they didn't necessarily do the survey because they already had maybe signed a petition. Um, and, and they were, yeah, maybe it wasn't the, accessible or me. Like I know that I, for example, did two. I did one survey and I also did sign the petition. So what I'm trying to do is narrow out some of that, the, the reciprocal information, and so that we have a better gauge. Because the way I'm looking at it is we just need to pull all of this together. And I didn't know if there was any way that we could do that while we're, I mean, I, the data is great and I appreciate you guys gathering it. I just wanted to try to find a place where we could pull everything together. That's all. Okay. Are you um, referring to the petition of signatures? Is that a petition or just signatures on that? Well, piece signatures and support. Paper that Josh thing. Thing. It's not really a petition. Well, no, signatures no. on the paper that Josh. So you're referring to Josh, Josh's list then? Yeah, where we had, there was over 100 that said yes, but we didn't get to ask the secondary questions or anything like that. Right. And I wanted to make sure that if those numbers were accurate, I'm looking at 100 people that were leaning yes along with out of the 59 people that you pulled you know leaning yes and then some leaning no i wanted to purge and, and just make sure the data was accurate um so well, i didn't can know you if if we reopen the survey could you have those people probably not five because minutes they, 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 they may not have to access to it so that's why I was just adding that data in there. I just wanted to throw that out there and see the survey. There's a way. There's a way to. There's a way to give everyone access to a survey. And the other. Well, the, and yeah. I think they did when they when they filled out that that document, which is the same as this. So I just wanted to merge our data. We don't need them to do this survey. What we need to do is make sure the people that did this survey it's valid, and also the names of the handwritten one are valid and we can cross reference them and make sure we collect the data the proper way, I would assume. We well, don't need them to do a second survey. Why don't we Sorry. just hold on to your list and hold on to our survey? I mean, we're not really looking at a vote here. We're looking more at collecting information. Um, right, well, that's why I just wanted to make sure the data was accurate. That was more my point. You yeah, were this looking is, for this is not a vote. This is a soliciting of information to find out um, you know, what people have for concerns yeah, and concern. you know, possible solutions to those concerns. So we're, it, we seem like we are focusing on data and statistics. It, it's, the just, it's just, that's a, why I brought that up. That's all. Okay, so if we're going to just focus on concerns, bring, like, let's talk about the concerns, but the data is the data because we just want to make sure it's accurate. Okay, well, this was just an overview of a general feel, but really when you get into doing this, what's really more 
important is what are the concerns? Can we deal with these concerns? Can we resolve them? Absolutely. So, um, I mean, we can hold on to your piece of paper and in, in this survey also. We can do both. So I'm going to go ahead and continue. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, you're welcome. So the the next question would be, would you be comfortable sharing these trails with snowmobilers? Um, and when we, I'm going to just quickly look at the out of town responders. And in this case, we have the same five who do not want the trails here. These are the same four Northfield residents. Um, and this looks a little different from what I gave you because I went back and looked at the data instead of just when I gave you originally just answered this one question, would you be comfortable sharing trails with snowmobilers? This one has um, looked at all three questions that had to do with self-identifying as snowmobilers. So of the 75 out of town resident, out of town people who um, answered the survey, 81% self-identified as a snowmobile user. Um, and then of the remaining group, 14% were comfortable sharing trails and the 5% were not. If we look at um, Berlin residents, we have 10% self-identified as snowmobilers. Um, and then for the non-snowmobile users, 43% out of the total um, were not comfortable sharing trails and 28% out of the total were, and 19% needed more information. And then on the final thing of just looking at the statistics, um, this is for Berlin only. And we were trying to get a feel for um, people who are actually using the forest. How do they feel about um, added snowmobiles into the forest and how comfortable are they sharing trails. And this blue going across here would be people who, um, for the first question, don't want a trail. Um, the green would be the people who are in support of the trails and the um, gray are people who um, need more information. So if we took all of the Berlin residents, we found out that 45% of those that responded um, did not want snowmobile trails. 41% um, did, that's pretty close. Um, then I took out everybody who said that they never visited the Berlin forest. And when we took out those people, um, so the statistics changed a bit. This gray part stays pretty consistent, so I'm not going to discuss that part anymore. But um, now we get 48% saying no, they don't want the trails, and 37% saying yes, they did. And that's a 11% difference. And if we go over to this final column, these are people who um, never visit the town forest or rarely. And rarely is like less than once a year. Um, so maybe they've been there a couple of times. And if we look at this group, 53% um, did not want the trails while 33% did want the trails. So there was a difference of 20% for this group of respondents. And then if we look down here at the bottom, um, the question is about, will you be comfortable sharing these trails with snowmobiles? If we looked at all Berlin responders, which we've done already, there was a 7% difference. If we took out people who had never visited the forest, um, at that point, 45% are not comfortable sharing trails and 33% are comfortable. That's a difference of 12%. And if we take out people who never or rarely use the forest, 48% um, are not comfortable sharing and 31% are comfortable sharing. And again, a difference of 17% with more people not being comfortable. So those are, um, just sort of the basic overview statistics. I think I supplied everybody with the comments, the detailed comments about um, both for supporters, um, people who live outside of Berlin, people who um, 
live in Berlin and it was broken down by um, do you support or do you not support? So you can see all the comments for the people who were strongly yes, um, leaning yes, maybe leaning no or no. And you can look at those comments. Some of the comments are quite detailed. Some of them um, were just sort of standard comments. I don't like snowmobiles. I love snowmobiles, um, those types of comments. But we got some pretty thoughtful responses in there also. Um, and I think sort of the final thing is, um, you know, of our respondents to our survey, um, there definitely seems to be some concerns about adding the vast trail that probably should um, warrant further discussion. And there's also concerns about sharing trails that would warrant some further discussion. And I guess I'll open it up to see if there's questions um, about um, any of the things I just presented or questions about the comments that we shared with you. So uh, I'll start, I guess. Um, so ju just so I make sure I'm under the same understanding, a total of 59 people took this survey, right? So when you yes. talk about the percentages, if you know, if you're talking about 45%, you're talking less than 30 people. Yes, those are the yep, yeah, exactly. Those are the people responded. Um, this was the tool we had, um, given that we had six weeks during a pandemic. Um, so this is yeah, it, it definitely made it out there. I saw it all over the place on social media and um, front porch forum and I think everyone had their opportunity if they had interest one way or the other. Um, you know, and I saw some of the comments and, and I think they were very thoughtful. And I think, you know, things like speed limits and, um, you know, certain restrictions can be put, put in place to make sure that, you know, we address as many of the concerns as possible. So uh, I think it was well worth the time to do the survey. Absolutely. Wendy, I have a, a question on just general maintenance on the trail, but do you folks maintain the trails in the winter? Do we do maintenance on the trails in the winter? Well, I mean, uh, yeah. Do you do any kind of uh, maintenance on the on the hiking trails that are there now? No, I do not believe so. No, they're not groomed. Is that the question? Yeah, you're asking? yeah. They're they're not groomed. But I've been over there a couple times this winter and. Yeah. With this year's conditions, at least, they're packed. They're very easy to walk on. Yeah. I was all the way up to the top of the hill two days ago, and it was packed. It was very easy to walk. Okay. Uh, when, you say, when you say the top of the hill, you mean up by to the tower? Yes. Okay. I was, I was curious. Yeah. No, I went all the way up. Any other questions or the uh, well, um, I'm just trying to think. So the 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 trails now are just packed down either by snowshores or people just hiking up and down. Yes, right. Yeah. Oh, okay. it gets quite a bit of use. I saw five people, you know, not near the top, but when I was down near the bottom, I, you know, coming in and going out. I think that bottom part gets a lot of use. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on this? So um, it sounds like we're wrapping up. I just want to remind everybody that this coming Wednesday at 6 p.m. there will be a public hearing specifically to discuss uh, this this matter. Uh, that invitation has gone out, and so we'll see probably most of everybody here on on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the review of the police department cruiser for fiscal year 21. I'm going to share a screen here. It's on the agenda. The happy thing. So I won't kind of hang on to it. So I think I saw, I think I saw James. 
Dion, yeah. Came yeah. on. Yeah, so I, James, I just put on the screen the, the quote that you received uh, for the FY21 replacement cruiser. You want to talk about that? Yeah, um, so I contacted the coordinator for the state bids, and this is the quote I was given based on previous models of our cruisers that we've uh, had in our fleet. Um, we are, I don't know if it's the time of the year or what, but we are seeing a lot of kind of rather expensive repairs of the fleet that we currently have. So I think it's absolutely necessary we get this thing up and running as soon as possible. What have been your, what's been your issues with the old, the other cruisers? Um, uh, my Wait. own cruiser looks like there's an issue with the fuel tank. Wait, Wait to that. Enough, right? Water cooler, uh, or, um, uh, uh, that we're still waiting on. So we're down to three cruises right now, and there's already been a couple of occasions when it's been a. Everybody that signed in saw it over there and said, uh, everybody's uh, face. Figure out who's going where, who's got what car. Yeah. Chief, do you guys have uh, maintenance, maintenance logs for each one of the the cruisers? As far as what repairs have been done by the um, by the Ford dealership or by whomever, I don't know that we keep them in an organized fashion. Obviously, we keep all the documents um, for any repairs or bills that we have with the vehicle. Yep. I haven't so far collected them in an organized fashion, but that's not a bad idea. Okay. That's, yeah. Well, the reason I mention it is, you know. Um, Historically, and in, in other places that I've worked, um, you know, there sometimes it feels like a lot. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes they're spread out enough, so like, oh no, it's fine. And then you know, we've spent nine thousand dollars in the year on maintenance. But if we had it by vehicle, we'd know, you know, not only for right now, but down the road, you know, what were what our averages that we spend on a cruiser on maintenance per year per vehicle um, and you know it would just I think it would help us you know we went through the budget conversation last week and and put off one of the cruisers um, but if we're seeing a lot of budget you know pressures from maintenance it would be nice to know which which cruisers were the worst off and sometimes it's not always the oldest one right so yeah. I, I would just recommend maybe in the in the future starting a, a log of each one of the vehicles so we can say we did $3,800 of maintenance this year on the 2016 and, you know, $53 on the 2019. And that way we have a better log of. Right. John, John, there, there are some, there are some very uh, eat friendly fleet maintenance uh, spreadsheet uh, programs out there that, you know, we should be doing it. We, sh we should just be doing that. And I'm sure everybody's aware of that I guess I was never really tracking because I've never had this issue with my own personal vehicles, but you had a headlight that was a little bit out of alignment because it hit a deer. And now to get it fixed and in alignment, you have to get in there and adjust the whole assembly. And we're talking like $400. Mm -hmm. uh, outrageous to me just to knock a headlight back into alignment. Maybe if you hit another deer, it'll knock it back into a line. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the pleasure of the board on this new uh, budgeted 21 cruiser? Well, it's budgeted, right? Yes. C correct. And our intention, our intention is to sell the other two cruisers through um, bid. Is that yep, right? Through surplus. I'm working with James on that right now. I'm having him give me the descriptions because I don't know. I mean, I look at these vehicles, I don't know what they are. So I just want to know what the interiors are and some of the um, information. So we put it up for bid. I'll have something to write about. I also did look up um, the yeah. blue book value on these for trade-in. 
and um, the the low blue book was like six or seven thousand dollars, which still seems kind of high because I know that these vehicles have been you know, rode pretty hard. However, in doing this with a surplus, I'm thinking it would be good to set um, a low bid. So if we can say the minimum bid has to be twenty five hundred or three thousand, whatever you know the board is comfortable with, then I can get that information together pretty quickly once James helps me with the details as far as the interiors of the vehicles. Sure, I was just trying to net in my head what, what it was gonna cost us because they were both in the same fiscal year, right? The, the selling no, of the no, other two uh, cars and the buying of this. The two, yeah. the two yes, vehicles John. Were... We're, Yes, John, we're gonna sell these in 21. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, well, yeah, we, we'll, well sell. I make a motion to... Go ahead. I make a, I make a motion to uh, approve the purchase of the police cruiser for the amount listed of, and. Uh, approximately $32,000. I don't have the number in front of me right now, but. I right, second that. Any further discussion? I just had a quick follow-up question. Um, in the past, we've been approached with the, the price of the cruisers, 32,000, and then there's eight or ten thousand dollars of additional equipment we need to add to it. Is that the situation we're looking at here, Chief? Um, I think we can salvage most of the equipment it would take to outfit a brand new cruiser um, from one of the ones that's coming off the fleet. We can certainly mitigate any expenses of outfitting a new cruiser by this kind of. Okay. Care. Excellent. It, yeah, it'll be. Probably a couple grand to at least put the decals on it, which is unavoidable. Yeah. Not not at not ten thousand though, like we had seen in the past. So certainly hope not. No. Thank you. Diane, when do you think you're going to be able to get the two cruisers out to bid? I'm hoping within another week or so. Like I say, I'm I'm not trying to put pressure on James, but I really need the descriptions so that I can put them on the website and advertise them in the papers. But I also would like to have a minimum bid. And I, you know, I'm happy with like $3,000 as a minimum bid, but I don't know if the rest of the board is or not. And what's the low, what's the low blue book? Uh, one of them was 6,000 and the other was 7,000. One of them has more miles than the other, that's all. And that was a trade, but that was a trade in value. And obviously that's not outright sale. Yeah. Well, I mean, anybody who's bidding on them to buy them is going to be looking at putting money into them before they resell them anyway. Well, cause they will be as is for certain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're going to ship them right to the auction. I'd, I'd be fine. Typically, what do they sell for? What have we sold them for? Well, the, the last one, Justin, sold for $4,700 last year. And it right. was a vehicle about the same age as what the ones we have now. But then so, I've had others in the past where they sold for $2,500. So, so, so if we two. put a minimum of $3,000 or $3,500 on each of them, yeah. right, does that seem reasonable? It seems reasonable to me. And if nobody bids that amount, well, okay, well, I'll come back to you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be good with that. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a question and I'm sure there's good reason for it, but have we asked if we could just trade one of them in towards the new vehicle? Um, you, I, I can answer that, um, John. I did work for car dealership, um, you know, many years ago and um, they don't normally take, these are fleet vehicles and they don't take trades on fleet vehicles or we never did. Okay, because in a fleet vehicle, okay. the dealership does not make any money. It's what they call a courtesy deal. And so they make just a very, like they might make a couple hundred dollars just to inspect the vehicle. But I, I had never seen a time, and I worked there for 15 years, that we took a trade in on a fleet vehicle. It's a wholesaler that's going to buy one of these vehicles. Yeah. Uh, they're going to okay. buy it. They're not going to retail it. They're going to ship it right to an auction, John. Um, so the more people you put in the transaction, the more people that are typically going to need to make money. Um, that's how it traditionally works, but I wish we could trade. Them. So minimum 3,500. Is that what I heard? Yep. Oh uh, yeah. 3,500. Anybody have any different ideas on that? 
I concur with 3,500. So that, John, you make that part of your, your motion? You want me to make a new motion? Sorry, my internet. No, I guess just add that 3,500 to, to your motion. A minimum bid. Minimum bid. Yep. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Brad, there's um, uh, Chief has another item here. I'm going to pull it up. Okay. Um, the next one is the police department staff on workers comp. Ooh. So this is a memo that James sent out to everybody last week. James, you want to talk about it again? Certainly. Um, the latest injury with Sergeant Monty kind of brought up this topic of our ability to hold over vacation hours for somebody who's not able to use them. Um, I think it's extremely important that rather than getting money, people actually take the time that's allowed to them um, just to kind of mentally reset. Uh, unfortunately, to I don't think anybody here would have any issues with Sergeant Monteith holding over his hours. Um, we have to kind of include Officer Bacal in this because um, he's also out on workers comp. Um, so I'd like to propose that we have allow the ability to hold over hours to this X amount, 220 hours, I believe is what I included in the memo um, to allow officers once they kind of come off workers comp that they can then utilize their vacation time. So, I'm sorry, was somebody speaking? Because it was very muffled. Yeah. Um, so, James, they want you got two officers out on workman's comp now? Correct. Yes. Okay. And you want to take in, or they want to be able to hold over their vacation hours? Yes. Do we have to worry about our union contract with? We may have to, well, this is kind of an exception for somebody who's on workers' comp. There may be some wordage added into the union contract, but they're the ones who proposed this idea to begin with, and I would support it. So I'm just curious, how are you going to... <laughs> How are you gonna how are you gonna cut them loose for the 220 hours of vacation time? Well, staffing. I, I I agree with you that they should take the time. You know, the the because they need any job like that. I think you you need a few I a, a few uh, some time off just to take and decompress. Yes. Yeah. So, any idea how you're going to take in the. Uh, uh, spread this out so that it'd be um, be doable and not take and leave you really short? As it is now, I we have to constantly look at the schedule when people ask for vacation time or time off to make sure that it fits in with the schedule and doesn't accrue unnecessary overtime. Yeah. So something that we're always mindful of. Um, it's just kind of the cost of doing business. We, we adopted a new policy, uh, I think Tom, Diane, you guys were impacted this year not being able to take the time off. What were, what was the hours? What did we set for a town for you guys? For a, a 220, 220. 220? Yes. So we're looking at 250, right James with you? Is that what you said just to reiterate? <laughs> but with what Tom had told me what the town was. 220, 220. He's, he's asking for 220, Justin. Okay, I just, I wanted clarification. Thank you, I, sorry. I, I mean, to me, to me, I mean, people, this has been an exceptional year. Is there any way, James, that I know you're in support of this. I wanna support you as our chief. Um, do you feel like there's, there's any way we can do this as a one year deal and not make it, not reword our contract, not worry about that and still take care of all that? 
I do. Yeah, moving forward, I think we can address people who are out on workers' comp for long term, um, try to address it in, in another manner, perhaps in the contract. But for this year, I would like to see Sergeant Monteith and Officer Raquel covered. Yeah. James, when does the when do we go into negotiations with the contract? Uh, I, there seems to be some about that. I don't know. Sergeant Bissett keeps asking me when the town's going to approach him about negotiations. Um, it, this contract expires yeah, end of June. We should be starting it now, Brad. We should have probably started it by now. I think I our think, thought well, was was we'd have a town manager by now or a town administrator. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I hate to take and, and start it and then take and throw the, the guy to the lobby right off the bat. Um, but uh, you may recall the select board um, uh, there was a uh, a uh, an attorney in Rob Helper's office that you folks are going to use as part of this negotiation. That's mine. I'm, I'm blanking on his name now. John, I think you said you used him in Northfield. Um, uh, Cameron. 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 Scott Cameron. Cameron. Yeah. Scott Cameron. So I know uh, back several months ago, Scott and the uh, uh, the the budget manager for the union uh, exchanged emails saying that they were going to start the process. So I just need to, I guess, give Scott a call and and um, uh, let him know that we're ready to begin. I think John, you said you wanted to serve on on that as as well, and, and I think James says that. He wanted to be on that as well. Um, so as far as the 220 hours go, so right now they're allowed to accumulate 120. Is it by calendar year or fiscal year? It goes by your fiscal year. I'm thinking of, I think it's a fiscal. Yes, I believe it's fiscal. Yeah, because I had this discussion with uh, Sergeant Bissett. So Sergeant Monteith is out for six weeks. Is that right? Um, eight weeks before he can put any weight on his leg, which is well, it's been four weeks. So we're looking at at least another two or three months before he's back to work. Yeah, it just it just seems like we made it more than six months of the way through the year, and. He didn't use any, so now we have to carry it over on our books. You know, he's only going to be out a total of two months, but you know, not he could be out longer. I, I do recognize that. In the winter, it just seems like I I didn't like it the first time we meet, made these exceptions. I think that's the reason we have limits. Um, you know, and and in the other situation, I'm I, I'm definitely not uh, in favor of, um, but, you know, I think, you know, in Sergeant Monteith's spot, I mean, so if every time someone has a, a, a workman's comp claim, we're gonna have to do this potentially. I, I guess that's my, that's what I'm trying to weigh from a policy perspective is, you know, okay, if you're out eight weeks, you get to roll over your entire vacation into the next year almost. Well, couldn't that be addressed though, when you do your union contract going forward? Yeah, I think it is. And that's how we got to 120 hours, right? Oh, that's correct. That's correct. So we're making an exception to the union contract at this point, Brad. Let's see. You know, I just wanna, I think if they've earned those hours, then they should be able to use them, especially in a case where they're injured or sick, I, I just, <clears throat> I, I don't think it should be a big deal if they use their earned vacation time for sick time. So John, Angelina, based on everything you just said, I understand. Um, 
what you're saying, John, is that we negotiated a union contract. We went to what we thought was reasonable and what they thought was reasonable came to an agreement. Um, they agreed to 120 hours and I get it. Situations happen, things that you don't protect, predict, but when you negotiate a contract, you're kind of stuck in it. You, you're, you're, you're thinking that we might be costing the town fine money um, for the, the labor, which I agree. Have we put a calculation on how much that's going to cost the taxpayers at all in any way, shape or form? No, I haven't tallied so, what it was. I guess, I guess my point is, is if, if Sergeant comes back in April, he still has another three months to use 120 hours, another three weeks time. Oh, yes. Right. The, I mean, I guess that's where I'm going is the entire year's not a wash. And if I'm thinking about this wrong, someone please correct me. I'm not saying we should strip his hours or do anything like that. I'm just trying to think like if he's out for eight weeks, you know, do we really need to carry over almost the entire thing into the next year? Is that realistic? I mean, is that, I mean, because, you know, in that example, if he comes back and from, April to the end of June, he could still take those three weeks off. And, and those are her, his to be his to use. That's his earned time. Yep. That's right. That's right. correct. So, yep. so, so it, it is the, is this decision best to be put off for a couple months and see where, where we stand with, 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 uh, with the officer? No, I think that it depends on the situation. Okay. I don't know his situation. And it's hard to know people's situations. And I think that should be up to him. So Angelina, what we're saying is if he comes back in this fiscal year with enough time to use his vacation during this fiscal year that he, that he uses it, we're not, we're not taking anything away from him. We would just let him use it at, at the end of the fiscal year. Okay, well... Angelina, go ahead and elaborate on what you're, feel free to elaborate on that if you want, so that we understand where you're coming from. Well, maybe I'm just confused about what's being talked about. I, maybe I'm confused, but I just think that that's his earned time as a police officer. He's entitled to that time and how he chooses to use it and when he cho chooses to use it is up to him. I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think there should be a, a limit on his situation and not knowing that situation i definitely don't want to vote on a uh, the idea that he's only allowed to use a certain amount of time in a fiscal year but that's what's in his contract that they they are given a certain amount of time every fiscal year we're we're, we're just saying that uh, okay. if he can so, use it in this fiscal year use it this fiscal year okay. yeah Okay, well, then, then the, that's what that is. But so I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be the thorn in anybody's side. I just, I just think, you know, Mark, Mark Monteith's time is his time. And I don't know the other officer, but Mark puts a lot of time into this town. And I, I just think that's up to him. Is there a caveat within the contract to pay officers for their time in lieu of taking the time to offset some of the hours? Is that allowable yes. under the contract language? Yes. So the town will buy out officers for their time. Mm -hmm. the, the argument is that due to an injury that the officer sustained on duty, he's not able to, he or she is not able to take that vacation time mm -hmm. understood thank you it sounds to me like before the board honestly before the board makes a decision on this we should probably have it reviewed um just to make sure it is a contract I, maybe we already addressed it in this conversation but i'm not comfortable um taking a vote or making a decision 
on a contract that we've already negotiated. I feel as though we need to send this to our either either Rob or somebody for review prior to taking action. That's just where I stand. Well, doing that would probably be a pretty good idea. Tom, I think you were on the right track. Um, there's no decision that has to be made right now. There's no. not to be right. Not need to be. We're not there's at the not. end of a fiscal. We're not at the end of a fiscal year. We're not even. Close. No one's in a position to to use or lose right now. Sure. Um, you know, this is something that we can think about. Look at the contract. I don't. I don't know that we need a lawyer to interpret it. Um, if you know, looking at the contract language. Um, but I think, you know, if, if we send it around and look at it, I, it's pretty clear. And then it's just a, a policy decision by the board on whether or not we want to make an exception to the contract. I mean, uh, you know, this is the, this is the thing about union contracts. Uh, you know, if it was in the other direction, would the union been for us? Yeah. Um, and Mark's our employee and like him very much and he does a great job. Um, so it's really not about him. It's about the overall policy around the union contract. Absolutely, and I, and I think at this point, we just need to take it under advisement. Thank you, James. I, Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 can see, I can see that, but my, I have a question about this contract. Can he just cash in on his, uh, can he, is he allowed to just cash in on his vacation time? There, I've had jobs where that's been acceptable. Yes. Diane or um, James is answering that because I'm not aware of that in the contract. I, I but yeah. I'd have to look it up. I was looking up more the 120 hour thing. Yeah. I, I think remember if I addressed that Tom in the memo I sent you. I know there was some wordage in the contract about unused vacation time being bought out. Yes. And I think the message that we want to send to the officers, uh, we, we support their vacation and, and we'll do everything in our power to, to make, have them take it in the, in the time frame that's required. We're not, we're not taking anything away from anybody. That's not the message we're, we're sending here. There's, there's no more discussion on this. I think we can take and bring this up at another meeting. Anybody object? Okay, what we'll do then James is uh, we'll schedule this in, oh, what? Probably another month, Tom? I'd say end of March. Half. End of March, you know, yeah. we'll have, we should have some other troops here and I, I think, uh, yeah, I think that'll be good. I'll put on it. Well, both James and I'll put on our particular files for end of March. Okay. Anything else on this? Hearing none, we'll move on to Fisher Road Culvert. So I sent a uh, draft application to the uh, uh, State Infrastructure Bank, and I was uh, there assigned a banker on this project. I was hoping she'd get me a, a memo. Uh, letter today for the select board's consideration. Uh, uh, she, they thought everything was in order, um, and the only thing really that needs to be to be done is to file an official application. You, you may recall that we are required to seek uh, town-wide approval of spending monies on on this project because it's over five years. So I, I don't know if it makes sense. Uh, that's the question I have to the, the, the state infrastructure uh, uh, bank, that if we submit an application now, and which is then becomes a placeholder, but it that becomes uh, contingent on the uh, town meeting vote by the, by the, by the town uh, itself. Um, I think they'd be uh, uh, reasonable to that. Uh, the, how this process works. Once, once the application gets approved by uh, the, 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 the bankers at the state infrastructure bank, they take it to the state infrastructure bank board to get final approval. And again, um, I, I 
trying I don't know the answer if we're putting the cart in front of the horse here or or not but if not I'd like I'd like the board approval uh, and, and this can wait till next meeting um, to submit that application uh, as soon as possible and um, uh, get in front front of the the their board for approval pending the outcome of the town vote. Yeah. So that's all that's I have on that, Brad. I was hoping to have something more definitive for you tonight, but he didn't come in today. Okay. Um, on that, um, so that's for a 30 year note? Up to a 30 year, year note, yes. And there's nothing, this is not a traditional bond. So it uh, traditional bond, you can't pay it off early. This loan, you could pay off at any time. Yeah. What's the, um, so basically what we have to do is, uh, is get the, get the approval for the monies and borrow. Uh, yes. Yep. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. And do you know how long it's going to take the bank to um, approve once we, if the vote goes through? She thought that once we get an application to them, it would take them three weeks again. So I, I'm, 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 I'm hoping that they could approve it in advance of the town vote and make it just contingent on yeah. the approval. Do you want a motion on this? I don't think not yet. I, or you want to take it? You want... I'll bring it back next meeting. Let me get something definitive from okay. from, from them. Like again, I expected it today. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there's nothing else on this, uh, the certificate for highway miles. So I sent you guys in advance. I'll share the screen real, real quick. Um, uh, Yes, I think I will. Uh, so every year, the um, uh, the uh, town has to certify its highway miles. I I, I sent it to you, and uh, the highway miles is the same as it's been for the last four or five years. Um, so there's no change. So I would just ask a recommendation that the board approve the certificate of highway miles. And oh, we'll sign it and get it set in the in the VTrans. Did you add in uh, Black Road going from uh, Class Four to Class Three? When did that occur, Brad? We never took a vote on that, which is an item we needed to discuss. That's why I wanted the Class uh, Four to Class Three road policy put in place so that we can make those determinations. So technically speaking, Black. Uh, Black Road is is the section coming off Crosstown is still class four and we're maintaining it, which I definitely think we should have a policy in place to <laughs> maybe change around our roads if we're going to do things like that. Well, I'm just trying to think um, one of the arguments on that was uh, the uh, of course, you don't get any money for class four, but you do for class three. It's not much, but. It's something. Well, it was um, something, and according to uh, the VSA laws, it, you can upgrade or downgrade a class four to a class three or a class three to a class four without having to make any additional changes to the road because they're grandfathered. So it, I even we're maintaining that road. Um, I'm glad it came up. That's That's been a thing that was on, even when Dana was here, that was an issue for me. I feel we need a policy in place to address that because there's nothing preventing us from taking a vote as a board in turning Black Road into a Class 3 road based on the VSA standards and the way the road stands today. The only detriment to our town is that while we're maintaining it as if it was a Class 3 road, we're losing state funding by not having it as a Class 3 road and leaving it as a Class 4 road. And all it would take is a vote from the board. 
So if I remember correctly, um, there was an issue Tim was having um, <clears throat> with maintaining the road, road temporarily uh, with the doubts, putting things in the way, and he was having trouble maintaining that road because of a culvert and other things. So I think that issue needs to be addressed as well um, before we change the class of the road because I don't, I don't think it's fair to our our road crews <clears throat> to be frustrated and not being able to plow that road that section of the road if we change it to a class three well according to tim davis i'm lee i don't know angelina if you're aware that i'm liaison to the road crew um and i've spoken extensively with tim davis uh tim tim that retired his son is not junior, but we'll call it Tim Davis Jr. for the sake of that. Um, and there has not been any maintenance issues. Um, and in fact, it's, it's been, there's, there's been no issues um, since, I don't know if you know, but the doubts have relocated. Um, and with the new neighbors, they're extremely happy with the maintenance that the town of Berlin is doing on that road. Oh, great. That's wonderful to hear. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. The only trouble with the, that Tim Sr. was having was there was a tree in the way and we took that one out. So. Right, right. So the reality is well, class three, class four, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're still maintaining the road as if it was a class three road. So my my opinion is, if we can upgrade and downgrade, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we take that road and actually get the state funding so that it doesn't cost taxpayers what it is? That, that's my take on it. But I also feel as though we need a policy as the ta for a town, as these roads may get developed, uh, to upgrade or downgrade them as necessary. I absolutely agree. I think that's a great idea, Justin. Taken um, if it's just a matter of a vote for the from from the board, um, we'll take and warn it for next meeting, and we'll take and see about upgrading that to a class three. When does that? Ha when does this list have to be in, Tom? Uh, February tenth. February tenth. I, I I think these two items have to be mutually exclusive. Yeah. Right, but wouldn't we want to make any upgrade determinations prior to putting that list in? As as minor as it may sound. I don't know the what's involved in it, if there is what you folks have for policies. I I just I can't speak intelligently to it. Um, we, well, I'm talking, I'm talking not necessarily on a policy level, but if we're going to set a precedence to build policy off from Tom, um, if we were going to say, okay, well, we want to upgrade this road to a class three road and here's why, and let's take action on it in this meeting. So then that adds whatever revenue for the town by adding half a mile, quarter mile, eighth of a mile, it doesn't, it's irrelevant there. Um, but we can take action on that and then can what is it how does it impact or alter what we're with the state application or the state funding there i think it, okay. i think it ends up being like 50 or 60 bucks the only thing that would have to be done is add the i can't even remember how many feet that was but you just add it to the class three section of the uh, form and then uh, submit it. Right, so we'd want to make that determination prior to submitting, right? Submission of this, this year's growth. Well, if you want it, if you want it to take and go for, for this year. Um, I mean, why wouldn't we if we're already maintaining it? Well, what we, the I think the agreement we struck was we would plow it in the winter, but we weren't going to do work on it in the summer. Which, according to the VSA standard, is acceptable for the class three roads. We went through that. I didn't hear you, Justin. Which, according to the standards for the 
class three roads and the maintenance requirements associated with it, that was perfectly acceptable. So, I mean, I know it's minuscule, but why wouldn't we just accept the money from the state that we're entitled to due to maintaining this road when, if that's what we're doing? Yeah. We're here a motion to that? We, we need to move to make, uh, make Black Road a class three road? I would, I would believe so, but I think we should so, probably, we should probably warn it because this isn't really coming under this, uh, item um, right that's why i'm asking if we just if we hold off and we make that at our next meeting like you had mentioned brad which i agree okay. with and then we how does that impact with the state we can just add it on correct that yep. was more you of a just discussion add it, you, just, you just add it on i think we did um, let's put that on the next agenda then okay yeah i think i'd like to have further discussion too because um <clears throat> i believe i own half of house road and that that would be interesting to see if that would become a class three road as well well if it's if you own it personally then then no <laughs> it has to be a a, a town right of way there is actually a, it needs to be a town road um uh, angelina are you on uh I mean, I don't want to get into the weeds over this because this sounds like absolutely something we can discuss at the next meeting. But mm -hmm. is is your road a private road or a public road? It's a dead end. That that I, I get it, but is it a private road or a public road? I'm not sure. We can look into it though. Yeah. <laughs> Seems reasonable. Okay, so we'll table that to mix the certificate of highway miles to next meeting. Um, uh, see here, uh, amend resolution for municipal planning grant, Tom. So I sent you in advance for the, 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 the grant we have to do the new town center. We, um, Dana was named as the, uh, the main, uh, CEO for lack of a better term on that grant application. And we have not been able to get any uh, distribution from the state for funds that the town has expended uh, because our, the main person who was in charge of doing that is no longer with the town. So I sent you out a, an amendment to name me as the, the person uh, responsible for that grant so we can get our uh, monies back from the state that we have spent from the general fund. Do I hear a motion on that? I moved. Well, you were, your lips were moving. We She's couldn't muted. hear you. You're on mute. She's, she's on mute. I moved. Call second. There you go. John, I make John. a motion to approve and amend the resolution for municipal planning grant so Tom Badowski can move forward with that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have, a, we have a couple motions here in a second. <laughs> um, we'll go with, uh, we'll go with, uh, uh, was it John? John, John was first. Okay, so all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. Motion carries. And okay, Tom, restitution for illegal tapping. So I sent you in advance uh, Rob Helpert's. Uh, I'm going to pull it up here. I think I will. Hold on a second. So I have up on the board, Rob Helpert is, has, and I have spoken to um, the parties involved in the illegal tapping of the, of the town forest. Um, you could see at the bottom of the page, I, I've highlighted in yellow uh, a compromise that Rob seems comfortable with, I'm comfortable with, and, and the uh, appellant is, is comfortable with. 
in effect totaling $5,931.25 as part of restitution for the illegal tapping. Uh. And Tom, Tom, just to be clear, and they're gonna remove all their taps immediately or already have? I believe they already have, John. Okay. Motion on this? For acceptance? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a fair offer or not, so I'll just have to go with the, the recommendation from Tom. Um, so I'd, I'd move acceptance of the negotiation and deal made between our lawyer and um, Howard Anderson um, on the illegal tree tapping in the amount of $5,931.25. I second that motion. What was the amount again, John? 59, 31, 25. Gotcha. I thought you said 15,000. <laughs> Just wondering where you got the number. Okay, have a second. Second. Any further discussion? Yeah, yes. just, just, just quickly. Oh, that sure. $5,900 will go into the conservation fund bucket, right? You tell you, us. You can tell me where you want it to go. Is so, that where you want it to go? So have we weighed I, in? I don't know. I might have missed it, John. Did we weigh in with the conservation on this? Do we weigh in with this? The, the board's still on there. I see Tom's still on here. Folks from the board are still on here. Do we weigh in with these guys at all and see what they felt about this? No. No, they what they said is that at the last meeting is that the town should take it to their attorney and, and resolve it. So that's where we're at. Tom, I Tom, I see you're still on here. Willard? Oh. Yeah, how do you feel? What is your opinion on this? You're on mute, bud. Tom. Oh, he's working on it still. I've asked them to unmute, Justin. No, I, I know. I, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. I can. Tom. All right. Well, I think that, uh, you know, the con I can't speak for all of the Conservation Commission, but um, there, there has been damage to the trees in terms of a saw log. Um, foresters tell me that, that a saw log that has been tapped then becomes pulp, or at least the bottom eight foot, or the bottom saw log. So we did not try to estimate that damage because uh, that damage, uh, you know, it'd be very arguable. It'd be a, it'd just be a, a mess. People arguing how much the trees were worth because some of them had been damaged by the, by the um, ice storm and had been, um, uh, stained internally and so on and so forth. So we said, well, let's go this route and we'll compromise there. So we didn't include any damages for the damages to saw lots. Um, so we thought that the full amount of the money, the profit he made from the, from the taps, from the syrup um, would be fair. Now, um, I, you know, I think this is probably a case where we can't argue it forever. So maybe half the, I would, my personal feelings would be half the, or Rob Halpert's uh, compromise is probably reasonable. It cost him a lot of money to remove all the taps that he had up there. I know that. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't object to that. But um, I just wanted to raise the fact that we did, Conservation Commission did not include the damages to the saw logs that were up there. Thank you. 
Did we, Tom, did we notify our insurance company, put them on point and, and I, think about did, the bifurcation? Justin, Justin I did. Yep. I did contact them and I sent, I did send a copy of denial to Tom. I thought he forwarded it to you, but maybe he didn't see mine. Maybe I didn't. Anyways, there, okay, I'm just trying to get the information. Yes, I have we it. did, Justin, and it was denied. Yeah. So they won't, they won't advocate for us in any way. Okay. No. no. Okay. That's all I need. So, so I, I guess my question still, still just remains. Do we have a preference which account this money goes into? Diane, is there an account that could use it more than another or would you recommend the general fund? Well, I, you were talking the um, Conservation Commission, I believe. That's To me, that's yeah. fine. I mean, whatever route you want to so, go. Yeah, I think so. The reason I asked was because, you know, um, given where the trees are um, and the, the, the bridge project coming up, I thought maybe we could use some of that money for the bridge project. It puts back into that same hill, um, keeps the conservation committee uh, funds, you know, appropriated at the level that they are now. And then the, the rest we can put where, wherever people want, but that's what I was thinking. I see Tom has his, Figure up. Yeah. The only comment I'd like to make is that uh, that particular parcel, that 406 acre parcel, was, uh, wasn't was purchased with town funds. It was all purchased with, uh, with grants and with um, um, donors. And it was pur purchases for the purposes of, and there's a whole list of purposes for recreation, for the protection of wildlife, for water quality, so on and so forth. So the Conservation Commission's opinion was that if the property was purchased for, the pur for these purposes, then the money, this money ought to go back into the purpose that this, that this land was purchased for. And, and there, there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a bridge, as you know, that has to be redone. There's, there's water bars, there's um, repairs to erosion along the road that needs gonna, gonna require heavy equipment. There's, there are maintenance type, there's a lot of buckthorn that uh, the Conservation Commission historically spent a lot of time cutting and removing. Um, so I think the Conservation Commission's uh, opinion was since the land was purchased for these purposes, the money ought to go back into those purposes. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to amend my motion to uh, say that the 59-31-25 go back into the uh, Conservation Committee fund for the purposes of maintenance of the trails and bridge on um, Irish Hill. I second that. Okay. All those in favor? All right. Is there any more discussion Aye. on this? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, Brad, right now this is the, we added this new item to talk yeah, about the town clerk budget. Yeah. Okay. So what was the what's the deal with the town clerk budget? I think Rosemary talked to John sometime John? last week on this and Oh, yes. Um so uh, I know that all of the select board members um received uh emails from uh, Rosemary and Corinne um, in the past couple of weeks. And I, I was just under the uh, wrongful assumption that um, the budgets had been gone over internally with uh, the town administrator and uh, finance director. Um, when I went into the office uh, on Friday to um, uh, take out papers, uh, they, they being the town clerk's office, let me know that no one had discussed their budget with them um, in any detail and felt that 
uh, rightfully so, that they were being ignored and left out of the process, which I don't think was our intention at all. Um, and yeah. please, if anyone disagrees, speak up. But that certainly was not my intention. Um, they had some very specific asks in their um, budget, specifically around pay. Um, it looked like they did a lot of homework around what others um, make in the area um, in regards to the town clerk. And they also asked, um, after outlining a number of duties that Corinne does, um, that she become full-time. Um, I have uh, talked with both of those ladies extensively, and I think that um, if we were to make Corinne full-time, um, you know, I, I think that uh, Rosemary would be open to additional hours at the town clerk's office. Uh, but she made a very good point that, um, you know, there's a lot of work that just because the office isn't technically open to the public doesn't mean they're not working. There's a lot of filing and a lot of things they have to do. So um, I wanted the board to discuss, uh, you know, that piece of the budget. And um, a lot of you have been residents and on the board a lot longer than I have. So uh, I may be missing something, but I wanted to bring it up and talk through it. John, I, 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 I support the idea of having uh, the assistant town clerk being full time as well. I think that Berlin has grown to the point where it has, um, or where it is, and, and it's going to continue to grow. And the workload is only going to be more tremendous. I mean, I think Tom can speak to that, having filled these dual roles currently. Uh, I would like. Uh, I would like to see the town clerk's office open five days a week. However, though, if we're going to have two full-time positions, I, I don't know if there's any way that we can require that based on our um, uh, town charter or whatever we need to do. Uh, but that that's my only concern would be, I can see where there's definitely the need for two full-time positions. My concern would be that we're it, I want two full-time positions. I, I think we need to also be a little more business friendly and open five days a week. Is that, it, is anybody else we can do that? Well, I like the, that idea, Justin. The clerk's hours are, are um, uh, set by the clerk. So, they so, they so. are, and, I, and I, had a, I had a conversation with Rosemary today um, just about, you know, some different ideas and you know, things that I had heard and, you know, kind of, you know, the philosophy on, you know, how they work and the number of hours and the schedule. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, um, the town clerk would be willing, and I don't want to put words in her mouth directly, but I think she would be willing to have a conversation about expanding the hours of the town clerk's office, especially if we were to uh, make Corinne a full-time employee, um, it adds a little bit more flexibility for her to still be able to get things done and have an extra person in the office there. And when you, when, if any of you have spent any time with Corinne and she starts listing off the amount that she does, it's not all town clerks related. Um, she does do stuff for the rest of the town as well. I think, you know, whether it be a website or social media and uh, she seems like a team player and someone uh, that, you know, is, is good to have on our team and does a lot for the community and a lot for the town. And I think given the amount of work that we have, um, that we could certainly use her. And what's the, uh, what's the uh, town clerk's budget this year or um, that we voted on? Yeah, hang on just a second. I do. Here. 
49,038. Excuse me, 49,038. That's for the, that's for credit. No, that's the town clerk. And then the assistant town clerk is 19,600. Um, what are her hours, the total worked hours for Corinne? Uh, Corinne normally puts in about, I think it's like usually about 47 and a half hours every two weeks right now. What's her hourly rate then? Um, like 1950, something like that. Um, yeah, I don't have that right here. I, some like, I think seven, 1950, Brad, $20, some, somewhere there. Okay, mm -hmm. so that would take and change that line item from 196 to what, 37? No, 39. Uh, yeah, Diane, um, and I may not be correct here, but I think we have additional hours in there for Corinne to cover for um, Rosemary when she's out. So it probably. Once you add in FICA and everything, I think Brad's probably right with that price, but there were additional hours above her 20.5. I think that we had accounted for. Built in, but it's Rosemary only like up. maybe a week and a half or two weeks that are built in there. It's not very much. Okay. Yeah, because if she go, if you, if you hire her full time, then that part of it goes away. Right. Mm -hmm. So the question would be, where's where's the uh, the additional nineteen six coming from? It used to be before the state got their fingers in the pie, the town clerk's office was um, in this town at least was was uh, uh, almost funding itself through uh, birth and death certificates. But now that's all reported to the state, and they cut the the. The town clerk no longer gets those funds. Well, the town clerk does get the diverse certificates that they um, that they do execute. Yeah. So they get like ten dollars each. Yeah. Are there any funds from um, us being without a town administrator for a period of time that could be um, forwarded over within the budget to assist with this if we went? I'd, I'd have to look that up because I've been any uh, overtime that Tom puts in, obviously, because it's you know related to Good that. Good point. I, I do put into that account. Right. Good so point. I, I would have to look that up to see mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Thank you. I, would, I wouldn't normally suggest this. Um, this is fairly unlike me, but given the fact of where we are with the budget right now, I would and in, in the amount of surplus that we have, I would say that we should use surplus money uh, for this year and next year take it up as a additional line item. But just based on where we are with the budget now and all the hard work Diane and Tom and everyone have put into making cuts and getting it down to 2%, um, I would be comfortable personally uh, with using um, surplus to make Corinne full time and um, looking, yeah, um, I, I also want to bring up, you know, quickly, uh, the town clerk salary compared to all the other towns around. Um, and I think we should talk about that quickly, but um, John, I that, agree. That's the, I agree with your previous statement. I, I think, I think the, their process is the way let's handle this one item at a time. I think the assistant okay. town clerk that, that absolutely makes sense. Completely, 110%. And Corinne provides tremendous help to Rosemary, profuse amount of help. And Rosemary conveyed that in her communication to us as well. So I concur. Well, secondly, with the, when we get back to the, can, when, when we get to Rosemary or the, the town clerk's salary, John, were you thinking we would pull that out of reserves as well if we were to do anything different there? Yeah, I, I just, you know, looking at the other towns, um, 
And, you know, and I think this happens in state government too. Sometimes if you've been there a long time, you almost get penalized, right? Because you only get your COLA each year. And then the new person, a new person, if a new person was to come into the position, they would start way up here. Um, and, and we've seen that even with the town manager right now, right? I mean, in the amount of, it, the amount that we jacked up the salary, you know, the amount that, you know, we added to the police uh, um, chief's salary. And I'm not talking about going hog wild, but I think that we do need to recognize that she's, I think, I believe she's the lowest paid around from what I could see. Um, and, and she's been here 19 years and has a ton of experience. Um, and I, I, just, I think she's getting penalized for being a, a long-term employee almost at, at no one's fault, just the way the system works. So John, I think the whole town's getting penalized for being somewhat passive over these years. I think not only are we penalizing employees because of this ripple effect, but I really feel like we miss out on revenue that we could be generating um, that would help fund these positions. So, my only concern, my only, not con it's not even really a concern. My question is like, are there ways that we can fund these and should the board take, take a look at these situations, the, maybe the, the, the properties, the pilot properties or the properties that could be paying pilot money that aren't paying pilot money. I, I did obtain a list the other day and they would more than that they would sufficiently fund anything many of these positions in towns and men in the town and many of the support items that we need is there i mean should before we i mean i don't know what do you put the cart before the horse and make other things happen or how do we do this what do you think what's the board's pleasure on this where we have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of revenue that we could use to generate and help fulfill these positions and these salary shortfalls do we do we take it out of our reserves and then take it up next year as a, a di diligently, or do we do we look at these and then and and then act? I mean, I, I, can somebody fill me in on what their thoughts are on this process? Well, when you talk reserves, are you talking undesignated funds? I'm talking our fund balances, absolutely. I'm not sure you can use the undesignated funds like this. I think with any job, you start at a at a base rate and then you go up from there. So I don't know why we wouldn't start there. The 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 trouble with the undesignated funds is that they're supposed to be used solely to reimburse the taxpayer. No, no, Diane got clarification on that at the last meeting. Right, it, Diane, yes, am I wrong? Could, yes, um, because we were talking about loans, for instance, and that was acceptable for loans. I'm thinking what you're talking about for Corinne and Rosemary, though, is not so much using undesignated funds, is just going over budget. You know, that's that, which is that doable. Right. Yeah. So, so I how, think that's what you're really talking about. That's that's a good point. Di, can you explain how, if we went over budget, how that would impact our town finances? Well, it, it really is going to depend at the end of the year because there might be some accounts that you're not spending as much in. And if you do go over budget and it's an approved, you know, it's, it's approved item, I just don't see where there'd be an issue. In, in other words, yeah, you, you could go over budget, spend more than you were anticipating, but you might not, I mean, because there might be other areas that you're not spending as much in. So overall, I think you're looking at the bottom line at the end of it. This is what the, the total amount that you can spend is. And I don't think that this, you know, elevating their salaries is going to elevate that expense. So this, you know, it's way out of, you know, way out of whack. So you're thinking if we elevated the salaries to those positions, we'd still be within our budget, not a problem. I think we'd still be within it, or if we're not within it, it's not gonna be a whole lot that we're out. 
I mean, obviously, it's in that line item, yes. And but, how would we deal with raises on a yearly basis, or is it just a flat salary, period? Well, we give them a COLA, uh, cost of living increase. Yeah. Every employee gets that, or has been. Yeah, so that's where we came up with a 2%. And, and to say that I, didn't, I did not discuss with Rosemary what she brought to you, but she didn't talk to me about it either. Hmm. That's why when she sent you the letter and then all of a sudden I found out about it, that's when I did bring it up to a meeting because I really did not talk to her about that part of it. You know, there's other issues I talked about in the, um, in the budget with her, but I didn't talk about payroll. I, I just, I'm sure I didn't with her, or probably with anybody. We, we went with the 2% and it went across the board. So what you're saying, Diane, is we, if we leave the budget as it is, the bottom line, mm -hmm. and just increase whatever the board's pleasure is, the, the, the salaries or salary to a full-time position, then we'll still be within, or we won't be that far in the red at the end of the fiscal year. De depending on how much you're spending on other items. Let's say uh, we have another Irene. Well, okay, then that's, you know, everything Everything's is out the, window. You know, out the door. But, um, but it's my understanding, and, and I have talked, you know, on occasion to the CPA about this or the, uh, the auditor yeah. and saying, if you're not, you know, if you're not within the budget there, you explain why you're not in the budget within that item. And okay, if you're gonna elevate her pay from 49,000 to 100,000, well, then I think that might be a different story. But if you're gonna elevate it by four or 5,000 or whatever you're gonna do, that is not going to impact the budget so that the budget is gonna be over by 100,000 or more. It's yeah. just gonna be her, just her line item. Yeah. John, what was the, um, when you read through the, the emails, what was the, um, for a comparable size town with a hospital, what was Rosemary's, uh, the, uh, the town clerk getting? I'm pulling up, I'm pulling it up now. I don't want to get the number wrong. I have two numbers in my head and they're always off. Um, you could come back to me in a minute, Brad, I'll have it. Sure. Um, so, so, so something for the board. I understand Rosemary's uh, discussion. You're also talking about Corinne. Do you want to get something in writing from the town clerk on how the hours are going to run and be used that, and, and, and then, you know, predicate your decisions on, I, I think I'm hearing Friday hours is, is wanted. Uh, I know I've had that conversation with Rosemary and, and um, I suggested that she write up that schedule for your all consideration a couple months ago. And, um, uh, I, I, I just think this board should, should get something in writing uh, on what, how this is going to work. And so you guys at least get to say, yep, this makes sense in this. And then they, then you can justify it to, to the, to your towns folks. Based on our, our town charter ordinance, uh, whatever, which dictates that the town clerk is an elected position. Does that allow us to mandate that they put that in writing and adhere to those hours? Or is that just general, uh, just basically like a general consensus? I mean, how would that work? Well, Justin, I don't know if it, if it's, uh, I don't know the ant. Uh, I, I mean, it's just, it's just, common decency and good practice, I think, on good faith effort by, by the town clerk's office. If they're, if they're asking for additional monies for the assistant clerk, and, and I would think that the select board has the right or has, 
can can ask where those monies are being used for and and say yes that makes sense and, and again fr having somebody here from the town clerks on Fridays is really needed you know it, it ends up we do it right Diane and, oh, okay. Jen, and yeah, yeah you know. we do a lot um, but just to for, to your point um, Tom, I don't, I think the only thing that the select board can do for an elected official is to set their pay rate. I don't think they can make any other demands. I mean, so they can why, make suggestions, certainly, so, so, but. So, so if that's, if that's the, an issue, make the other half of Corinne's time a town employee, not a town clerk employee. And, I don't know and, if you can. But I'm not sure you can do that because she, um, the town clerk by law has to have um, a town, um, you know, an assistant town clerk. clerk. But I don't know if that assistant town clerk can also work for the town. That I'm not sure, you know, as a, uh, an employee, because then where would her allegiance be? Where would, you know, like if the town clerk said, no, you're going to do the birth certificate. And then I say, no, you're going to help me with payroll. I mean, I'm no, so that's an issue sometimes. And this is like a state statute, I believe. Yeah. How are you making out, John? Between fifty-five and sixty thousand um, was was the new um, town clerk in Barrytown. Uh, they don't have a hospital, um, and that's for a brand new person coming in. Um, I had the Morrisville number here. I just can't find it here in my email, unfortunately. Um, well, <coughs> the Morrisville. They really were like all. It. Yeah, they were all mid fifties to sixty. Um, I just don't remember the exact amount. And Rosemary's not even at fifty yet, with eighteen years or nineteen years. Yeah. So, uh, she, well, she's at forty nine. Or, or will be an FY twenty two. Yeah, well, she would be an FY22 according to the budget. That'd be a $6,000 overage in that line. To get her to 55. Yeah, I'm not suggesting an exact amount. I'm just telling you what was what what was researched and what was found. Um, but well, was I mean, it if, Morristown, John, that you were looking at? Because I got Corinne's, what Corinne sent. And for Morristown, it's yeah. a town clerk treasurer. That person's, you know, has two titles. Uh, that person was getting sixty-three thousand dollars a year. Is it was it Morristown? Yeah, it was. Yeah, uh -huh. you're. That's so. That's the one I'm you looking at. But that, like I said, that person's town clerk just, and town treasurer. So what's your, if you were to take and go with the town clerk's recommendation and Crin went full time, you would be looking at 20, 20, 25,000. Yeah, roughly uh, 20, 25, five. I mean, what do people think? I mean, I just, I, I know this conversation has been had in the past and I've never been a part of it. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that we have good discussion about it as requested. Yeah, I personally have no problems with it. Um, I think Rosemary is definitely worth um, the thing is we've already okayed the budget Um we just have to be able to figure out who we're going to pull out twenty five five. If you want to have uh, right, but we have then you got to take I mean, go the through the agony. Then you got to figure out how you're going to take and get the the town clerk's office open, um, forty hours a week to the public. But we, I mean, the the budget's not done until we sign the warrant, right? Uh, until we sign the the notice. Correct. Correct. I mean, I mean, we can always take an amendment or put a, 
this would be terrible this year. Um, well, that, yeah, I mean, that's what, that's why I was suggesting, uh, you know, using, using surplus money for 22 is so we don't have to go through and blow up what we just did. Um, yeah. But, but and, again, you know, I, I think, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Joe. But again, I think what Diane's saying that I, I, I think I like Diane's solution better. You just overspend one line item and then you manage it so you underspend the, another line item going into it. Twenty. I don't think twenty five thousand. If you're talking twenty five thousand dollars on a three million dollar budget is going to be difficult. So so um, that's how I would suggest just overspend it in her in her line item. And, so and, and so you don't have to you don't have to change this warning. We, you guys don't have to meet again, um, uh, and you just you just um, uh, in FY twenty three make that correction in, in, in the FY twenty three budget. Yeah. So the only question. Yeah, I'm okay the only, with that. I'm thinking, the, the, only, the only the only trouble then becomes is is uh, getting the office open the five days a week because that's basically what we're, what we're buying here. That, that, that's I what I'm agree, saying. You, Brad. Should, you should get something in writing from 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 the town clerk, and I think she'd be she'll be agreeable to it. I think she will, and I and I think Rose, Rosemary's worth worth the money. She's she's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, you know, the other thing, um, if I could just interrupt for a second here, the other thing, Brad, you had brought up a long time or quite a while ago, is that. Um, each one of us should have goals in our jobs. And if you achieve this goal, this is how much money you're going to make. So if you are open, you know, for this, you know, this time, 40 hours. yeah, whatever, you know, then we, you know, we, we would pay the additional 5,000 or, you know, something to that degree. All I'm saying is if you have goals that each person can achieve, then sometimes it's easier to swallow. So you can do that with an employee, but I don't know if you can. But do yeah, it I know, and I just thought of that after. It's like you're, you're, you're skipping over that little gray line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would work for me, I guess, but not for her. Yeah. Um, well, I guess somebody would have to bring it up to her. I, like I said, I talked to her about it today and said, you know, would you, you know, if we could get Corinne to be full time, would you consider expanding your hours? And, and she went in uh, to a lot of detail about, you know, the stuff that she does on, you know, Fridays already and um, work and the stuff behind the scenes that they don't have time to do and there's people in there, but, you know, said that, you know, with it, with Corinne, the Corinne, those extra hours, you know, she thinks that she could open up five day, days a week. And I, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but um, that, you know, she would still be able to get stuff done, I think. And I, I really don't want to put words in her mouth, but it sounded to me like she was more than willing uh, to work with us on uh, additional well, hours if was going to be full-time i if mean I was, we can go in there and say demand five days a week and she's going to tell her to stick it up or stick it up our rear end <laughs> well right? yeah the, the the thing it is though if rosemary wants to take and have the office or do do filing and whatnot for her for her end of it there's no reason Corinne could be the front person because she pretty much is now exactly right and i think i think, I think yeah, yeah I was one at a time, please. John, I think that's what Rosemary was saying as she thought through it in her mind was, you know, I would still be able to get stuff done if I had expanded hours where I wasn't the only one here. Um, Angelina, oh, you done, John? Yeah, Angelina. I think five days a week is uh, an acceptable proposition for expanding Corinne's position and ours. Okay, Justin? I was just gonna make the motion to approve that uh, we 
bring on uh, our assistant town administrator to a full-time position this year, well, continuously, but using uh, you, you, within our current budget, even if it means an overage for this year. Were you were you talking uh, assistant town treasurer, uh, town uh, town clerk, town, assistant town clerk? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. It's just getting a little bit. Yeah, assistant town clerk. Definitely not the. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, well, the 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 question would become then how you make it. Uh, how do you make it? Uh, I just made a motion. I moved that we approve the assistant town clerk to a full time position. So, do we need to get a second? We have a second. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, now for discussion. Um, so, how do we take in uh, and tactfully take and get the uh, get the uh, extra day in writing? I don't think we can. I think we have. I think that we warrant enough business, and we have to go on good faith. I think that Berlin is busy enough that we warrant two positions there. And I think that they really, really do work hard for us. And I think that we need to trust that in good faith, they will do five days a week, which is also what we need. Maybe the assistant town clerk position, we could look at it from a different perspective if that doesn't happen to fulfill what the town needs. But I, I, I truly believe we need to operate in good faith and think that things will work in a direction that's, best for the, the town. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Indeed. those in favor? Okay. Angelina? I, I mean, how do we know that it's going to be in good faith that the town's going to be open? The town clerk's going to be open for five days a week. Well, that's what we don't. Called. We I don't think that we do. But here's what I do know: I do believe that the workload is more than 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 what we have for hours right now, and I believe that the municipality as a whole will benefit from this, regardless of whether it's open Monday through Friday. However, I think that we would like to see it open through Monday, uh, Monday through Friday, and the board can just mention that, and I believe that it'll occur. Okay. I, longer, longer term thinking here, um, and I don't even know that Corinne would be interested in it, but when Rosemary decides that it's her time to retire, it would be nice to have someone that is prepared and well-versed in, in that role. And so it's, it's as much, you know, long-term uh, planning for town clerk as it is anything else in my view and making sure that we have someone there. Um, and, you know, realistically, you know, most people can't survive on a part-time salary. And I feel like we would end up losing uh, Corinne if, if we didn't do something here. So I support it. I agree. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Um, okay, Justin, you had something here? Yes, I did. I My apologies. Um, so in the January, February edition of the VLCT, my concern was... Um, we went to Australian ballot um, for everything at our town meeting, correct? We were that way anyway. Um, the entire meeting? We already were Australian ballot for a portion of it, but not the entire meeting. And then yeah, the, January, the, the January the to February issue of the magazine... I'm just saying it says if the select board votes to use Australian ballot for the town meeting with the informational hearing is it's required pursuant to 17 BSA subsection 2680G. The open meeting laws apply. So I believe one of the concerns I had was that we hadn't talked about this yet. Uh, and I don't believe that prior to our town meeting, we were going to have a, a, 
uh, an informational public hearing. We hadn't put, we hadn't talked about that to my knowledge. Um, and we hadn't said anything for that. So well, we voted to not have one, but by law, we need to have one. I think there was a stipulation there with the vote. Um, Say that again. I think because of the COVID thing, they did not require to have the informational meeting. It was all. No. So this is the update in the January, February issue from Vermont Leagues of Cities and Towns. Yeah. That's why I'm calling it out. Or I, I found it and that's why we need to have a discussion on it. And I'm surprised we, we should have known this. Um, it says if the, I can share the article, my computer rebooted. Uh, I'm on my phone now. But COVID related changes for the town say that if we're going to go to Australian ballot, we're required to hold an informational hearing. So the, we, we absolutely need to have an informational hearing. Yeah, but the town was already on Australian ballot before. The only thing that could be voted from the floor was um, non-binding. Um, everything else was uh, the budget, the elected officials, all that was Australian ballot already. Can we get clarification on that then? I just wanted to make sure that we weren't putting ourselves in a position where we were in violation of any of the Vermont state statutes, laws, whatever. Well, uh, because, I mean, it, it, it clearly says in this article that if we vote to use Australian ballot, regardless, I mean, it doesn't say whether you were prior, whether prior you were using Australian ballot, whether you're, you know, it doesn't have a precedence in any way, shape or form. All it says, if the select board votes to use Australian ballot for town meeting, an informational hearing is required pursuant to 17 VSA subsection 280 slash G. The open meetings law, open meeting law applies to this informational hearing, so it can be held remotely per Act 92. The law also lifts the requirement that a person collect voter signatures, so on, so on. So I feel as though we need to have an informational hearing for our taxpayers based on that. And if we don't need to, then we don't need to, but I'd be happy to help with it. I, I'm sure that we could get people from the town clerk's office, town office, to just go through the items that are going to be voted on um, and have a, a, a brief public hearing, even if it's a live document that lives on YouTube or something like that. But it, it, it appears that we'd be in violation of Vermont statute if we didn't so I'd, I'd like to have the answer definitively yeah that yeah my only cool. question is um how are we going to do that remotely well that most... again. how are we going to do that remotely well the, the, i think the first question is whether or not we need to the second question is if we need to how would we do it and i would think that we would do that over a live document that lives on YouTube with like a link or something like that, um, where it can be viewed with also a question and answer at the end where we go over each of the items that are gonna be voted on. Um, but that that would probably satisfy the state statute. I mean, there's only so much you can do, I get that. But I mean, we'd also have to, it, so that it can be held remotely per Act 92, we'd have to review Act 92 and make sure we are in compliance with that. So I think the questions that you're asking or the answers to the questions that you're asking will be uh, discovered, you know, as we, as we dug into this, but I think it's something we need to definitely pursue. Well, the, probably the thing to do would be have Rob look into it. See just what it is. And then um, uh, if we do need to take and have a um, presentation, we've got till March, to do it or probably February, mid February to do it. Um, so we can get that done, I'm pretty sure. Um, I, I'm so I'm I would rather not spend money on the lawyer on this one. I think I think we can get the same result, Brad, if we just call the Secretary of State's office and ask for clarification, maybe. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tom, you think? do you do that tomorrow? 
Justin, I'm Justin, I'm looking through the magazine. You what page is that on so I could so I know what I'm talking about when I call? Uh, it should be page four. It says town meeting day. Maybe maybe it was yep. prior. Uh, yep. town meeting town. day is fast approaching. Yep. Yep. See over on the right hand column where it says COVID related changes. One, two, third paragraph down on the right hand column. If the select board is how okay, it's yep, start. yep, yep, I got it. Okay, all right. You see I'll where follow. you see where I'm bringing that up. I, I mean, I wish we had known this before, but I mean, it is what it is now. So I think it's something we definitely need to investigate. Wouldn't you concur? I'll call the Secretary of State and see if, what the take is on this. Okay, and I would also like to know what it is for high risk patients, as I am a high risk patient. Uh, <clears throat> Who, and I've been on the select board, so I, I would like to know what their solution is for me personally. Well, the as I understand from what Justin is saying, as long as the uh, you can take and do the do the presentation or the information private through a YouTube. Okay, I'm just making so sure that I'm not going to be exposed or have to go into a situation where I'm not comfortable. No, I don't so I think I think the second part to that, Angelina, to answer your question would be we needed to do it in pursuant to Act 92, which is specifically addressed in that paragraph as well. Uh, paragraph as well. So the uh, I think the Secretary of State or John Quinn, I think your recommendation would absolutely be where we would get all the information that we need to make an educated decision on this topic. Yeah. We would still vote that way. We just we would just have a meeting beforehand or or a presentation online. I mean, it could be as simple as reading down through the through the different ballots at the beginning of a meeting in a special hearing um, to and letting people you know address their questions. I, I don't think it has to be anything super fancy. It could be that presentation like Justin said. I think I think it's easily doable. I think we should just see what the Secretary of State office says and go from there after the next meeting honestly i almost feel angelina in in consideration of what you just said as well i almost feel as though our our taxpayers deserve to hear that so i think it would be a great idea to go ahead and give a rundown of the items that are going to be voted on give an explanation on how they came about and and give a just a brief rundown on everything anyway so would that mean that that us as a select board meet in person or how would we do that remotely? I'm just, I'm not trying to be, you know, a pain in the ass. I'm just, I'm just asking what it's going to look like. No, what I think that would consist of is that would consist of one or two, maybe whatever board members felt comfortable doing that along with maybe any town administration that wanted to discuss the, the specifics not even all at the same time, but everything could be put together and it would be pretty easy to have a quick rundown of the everything that we're voting on. It doesn't mean that the board needs to get together in person face to face if that's what you're asking. It means that maybe the board can delegate this task to an individual or two, which by the way, I'd be happy to do. Um, along with other members of the, the, the municipal office, that would be able to explain this to the taxpayers so that they know what they're voting on and they're educated on the topics. That's all. Okay. I, that sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. So, uh, was there anything else on that, Justin? Not right now, Brad, but I mean, I think we'll, we'll get our answers from the sec, you know, from the, the yep. state and we'll go from there, but thank you. Yep. But I think, I mean, even, um, even with uh, the time we've got, I don't see a problem with getting something put together to at least go over the budget. Not I mean, at all. I mean, I think we can go yeah. over the, I think we can go over the, all the items that we're voting on. Um, and we can go over the town budget on an individual basis. And, and I think we can get a lot of collaboration, which is, it'll probably be more informative than anything we've ever done in the past for the taxpayers, which will be great. And I, I well, the, the only thing is, is usually when we do the um, uh, appropriations, 
at the uh, at the previous town pre-town meetings, the uh, the people who were requesting the money were there to take and give their spiel on it. Right. Um, so I don't I don't know that we would go. I don't know that like as a as a select board we would cover the special appropriations. You you mean items like. Uh, not to single anybody out in any way, shape, or form, but I, one that sticks in my head is like Cal Cupboard Library. Yeah, we always—that's a special appropriation. I don't know that uh, we're going to be able to go through those. We may be able to provide a resource where people can continue over to to see why maybe Cal Cupboard Library or anybody else is looking for that. But you know, my my thing was the big things are the the town budget. You know, the school, yeah. the school board, the school. They always have their budget. They always have a video for it. I think the town budget should have a video, or and I also think that the fire department should as well. Those are those are kind of the big drivers in the community at this point in time, and I think well, those the, deserve the, a large explanation. And I think that the the vote that that's my piece. The, the the fire department that's a special appropriation right so i think that any of the any of the special appropriations that are out there they can develop their own and maybe maybe in the same scenario we can provide a resource you know where, where you could you could see the town budget and then all oh, okay great now we know we've got 19 special appropriation items and here's the ones i want to listen to and if somebody doesn't want to if one of the one of the special appropriations doesn't want to make their own video or 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 give any example of why they're asking for what they are well then that's they didn't do that but if they want to then then they have access to that as well but i mean i just think we need to we need to give everybody the opportunity to throw that out there on a digital platform given our circumstances currently so so if what you're basically saying is just put a link to the, if they have one, to the special appropriations or even to a website if they happen to have one. Well, I think, I think so. I mean, I, I, I'm not much on, inter, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not much on web design or, or how we can do that, obviously. But I think if you had a simple landing page associated with the town of Berlin's website that had, you know, hyperlinks over to, these other areas i think it would be enough of a resource but i mean at the end of the day it's still going to go back to i'd like to see what the secretary secretary of state has in association with this act 92 you know i mean that's going to determine a lot of what we need to do if that makes sense to you yep well i'm all for it i was kind of wondering when i was reading the uh when we were doing that how they were going to take and have um any kind of uh informational thing if we did away with the pre-town meeting but okay so we'll get that done tomorrow or tom can uh, call the secretary of state and go from there anything else on this okay town meeting warning language i'm gonna pull that up here brad I sent this out Saturday, I think, to you all. This is Rosemary put together for you for your consideration tonight. Um, if you make any changes, she said she needed it back by Wednesday, and we should make any changes on this document. So, want to scroll back up to the top? Yep. Okay. So due to COVID-19 restrictions, there will be no pre-town meeting or town meeting. All articles are voted by Australian ballot. Polls will open at 8 a.m. and close at 7. So after what we just discussed, apparently there will be no pre-town meeting face-to-face, -face, but apparently uh, we can do it uh, through uh, uh, informational meeting yeah or at least uh do an informational thing and then take and have uh, uh websites that they can go to look at they want to see what the what the uh, special appropriations are okay another thing that i will add is that i believe and i can't say for certain without speaking to her but 
I believe in the past, Corinne has put a lot of information regarding town meeting, et cetera, and what we just discussed as well in the news to knows, and also people communicate a lot through front page forum. And I think we could utilize that to help us with what we just discussed as well as, you know, what we're talking about now. Okay. Um, I, so. I agree with you, Flo, but I'm wondering, and you guys have to excuse me because I did just see my doctor about memory issues and that is a part of my disease as I progress through it. Um, I'm wondering about um, if we could perhaps have a, a town meeting where we are, what are those screens that go on the wall called? That's what I'm having trouble. Projectors, proje projection screens. Is that a possibility with Zoom? Well, you could just do as we're doing now, share the screen, right? It's yeah, except for on a, mm -hmm. like a projection, like on a projection. I'm sorry, my I'm sorry. I my doctor did say that my disease is progressing, and I'm starting to lose <coughs> my memory now. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so projection screen is what I'm what I'm trying to say. Like, is it possible to do a Zoom on a projection screen and be able to answer? Is I mean, do we have that technology? for Berlin because I know for the for 2020 I had a terrible time participating because we didn't have the, the technology or there was complications um, participating so I want to know if that's a possibility um, and what would that look like I have a vision but I don't know how to describe it it's a good question Angelina John can you speak to that Not well. <laughs> I, I don't know what we have. Um, you know, I, maybe, no, I, I, I just don't know enough about it. That's okay. I was just wondering from a technology standpoint, but Tom, are you aware of what's been utilized in the past more further back than when I became on the board in terms of what's been utilized in the past? Well, I think there, you, there was met in a hall and there was some sort of a pro projection screen. But again, it's just like me share, uh, me pulling up a document right now, mm -hmm. right? Me pulling this document up. Everybody can see that document, correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so we don't want to put something on a projection screen and then take a Zoom photograph of it. You just want to do it on your screen. Mm -hmm. And then you can just go through it. So, mm -hmm. so, so there's no possibility that that could happen on a projection. I think I it could. What, I think it the, could. What, what's the difference? If it's on a projection screen, it's only the size of your computer that you're seeing it on. It, an individual. Okay. Right? So my 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 impression was that people were going to go to town meeting anyway. No, um, no. Regardless, so I- No, no. no. Town, okay. town meeting, meeting physically has been canceled for 2021. Okay, so that clears up that. I, I just, I, what I thought I was hearing was that people were going to be asked to come into uh, no. probably the school and to vote. Well, they're, they're gonna, they're, they either can either vote remotely by an absentee ballot or can physically come to here to this office and vote. Yes. But there's okay. no, there's no discussion. There's no appropriations. It's just come in, fill out your ballot and leave. The, the, the screens that they were showing at the previous town meetings, they were PowerPoints for the school and for the town. And it was uh, strictly as an informational thing at um, uh, people who were there at the time saw it. Everybody else came through afterward and voted <laughs> and voted anyway. 
by Australian ballot. So it's the uh, at least if we take in um, do something on the on the on the computer and it's in a, it's in the, able to be viewed at any time. I think people be better better educated than they are with the with the pre town meeting and town meeting. Tell you the truth. So, uh, so if, if we did that somehow um, through YouTube or whatever, then that could just play on a projection sc screen for people to to see and hear. Sure. Yep. Okay. <sighs> Okay, anything else on the town warning meeting language? Town meeting warning language, there we go. I think you need to approve it. Yeah. Any, uh, well, a motion on that? Well. I was just going to ask for it to be put back up on the screen if I could. Yep. yep. Thank you. And if you could just scroll through it, please. Let me know if I go too fast. You can keep going. Is everyone else able to see it as well? Oh yeah. Great. Yep. You can continue. And Tom, did you make the changes that I sent to you, the recommendations? I have not, Flo. No, nope. that's, that's, that's needed to be a group discussion here. I see one change right after article 16 to just put a space after the question mark. A line space, yep. Mm -hmm, a line space, mm -hmm. And the same under article 11, I would just do a line space after the apostrophe. Not apostrophe, but you know what I mean. Parentheses. Thinking okay, one yep. thing, saying another. Yep, yes, yep, thank yep. you. And you can continue. Again, a line space after Article 23 and between Article 24. And the same thing between Article 25 and 26. Just for consistency and for making it all flow well and look well. Look consistent. Okay. <laughs> and so my only other suggestion, and we can talk about it as a board, but in the past, it seems like at the bottom, titles have been included and folks have been listed in order of their positions on the board. So for example, in this case, Brad is listed as the chair. Justin and I would be listed as vice chairs or vice co-chairs. Um, John is the secretary. So my recommendation there is to just put people in the order of their titles. And I think that's all it was. I can't remember if I indicated anything else to you, Tom, but that's what sticks out to me right now. Okay, I'll have Rosemary make these changes. This is this is her document, so. And then the, I think the only other thing that I did mention was us possibly signing it sooner than January 25th. Um, you know, we meet again on February 1st, but we're meeting tonight, the 18th. So if we're all in agreement to it, could we date it the 18th for tonight and then just all virtually sign it? Flo, I think we're also meeting again on uh, the 20th. So maybe we could just add that as a quick item as well then. Absolutely. That's a great point, Justin.
But I'm flexible. Those are just my suggestions and I welcome anyone else's, but I didn't want to make a motion until, you know, I saw the full document and we talked about if there were any changes that we requested. I'm sure Rosemary will make any, any changes that we seek. I agree. Is that something that something we can make all the changes Flo recommended to, and then uh, take it back up briefly on the, at our meeting on the 20th, please. Well, if we take and if we take and have Rosemary make the changes, then we can take and uh, uh, we'll be all set on the 20th. I think that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody see anything else? Can, you guys are just going to approve it with those changes and then you could just sign it, right? You don't have to meet again to discuss this. Yeah. Well, well, we can we can approve it with those changes, but we can see the document again, give us a couple more moments to review it and just take it up again on the 20th and sign it. Yeah, I haven't been able to sign anything. I haven't gotten any of those uh, <clears throat> requests for signature, which are pretty easy to do through Google. I have sent those to Angelina, so I don't know why you haven't received them. Okay, I have not been hmm. able to or seen them. Okay, because I have been sending them right along and I've always had you at the bottom of the list and and I just haven't gotten them back. On the DocuSigns, correct? DocuSign, correct. Yeah, I always sign. include her. No, in the no, and I do look for it, so I don't know what's going on, but maybe check your spam folder. Yeah, I'll take a look, but I don't think it goes there. So uh, someone will make a motion with those changes and they'll, we'll get it sent out to you. We'll, probably Rosemary's back tomorrow. We'll get it sent out to you guys tomorrow. I think motion. we're just looking, I think we're, I thought we were just looking to have those changes and then we'll review the document one quick time again. Um, just at the next meeting on the 20th is what I thought we had said, Tom, but maybe I'm wrong. The meeting on the twentieth is is a public hearing, Not right? And it's, it's also it's also it's a public hearing, but we also have a reg, it's a select board meeting. It's a warren meeting, so we could make additions or changes to the agenda. We could add that briefly. It doesn't. I mean, there's no reason we can't just take a peek at it again, then take action. Right? Am I wrong? I guess. All right. So um, I so that's what I. That's what I think we are requesting to do. That way everybody's comfortable. They can review the document. They can see it. We can have those changes done. We can take action at that point in time. It's only a couple of days away. Um, hey, Ken, uh, when the Rosemary makes the changes, can you ever send that out? Yes, I'll send it out tomorrow. Yep. Okay. Very good. I'll have to. <sighs> Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Minutes for December 21st, 2020, January 4th, 2021, and January 12th, 2021. Have a motion on the minutes? I'll make a motion on them individually. So starting with the first one, I make a motion that we approve the minutes of December 21st, 2020. Here a second. Second that. Additionally, I make a motion to approve the minutes of January 4th, 2021, 2021. A second. Thank you. And I make the motion that we approve the January 12th, 2021 minutes as presented. Your a second. Yep, second. Though, any discussion on December 21st, 2020? 
If none, uh, those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, January 24th, 2021. You mean January 4th, Brad? Yeah. Yeah, January 4th. Aye. 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 Motion carries. And January 12th, 2021. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Let's see here. Approved licenses, permits, vouchers, and applications. I have it in front of me. I'll make a motion that we approve the payroll warrant 21-14 for payroll from December 20th, 2020 to January 2nd, 2021, paid on January 6th of this year, 2021, in the amount of $47,501.66. Also payroll warrant 21G15 with checks 2830 to 2868 in the amount of $39,074.06. Included in the motion is the reconciled December bank statements for the General Fund Sewer Commission and Water Division and the December trial balance budget status report and delinquent tax report. We hear a second. Second. Any further discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, any executive session tonight, Tom? No. Uh, round table? I have. I have two things. Uh, one, um, I believe Corinne or Rosemary, I'm not sure, I can't remember which, sent out a uh, reminder about uh, town reports. We're still waiting on um, a couple reports that uh, select board report, a town highway report, um, and there were a couple of other things. I just wanted to make sure that uh, those were being worked on or those were done? I, I know Tim's working on the highway report. Highway was one, yep, okay. Brad, do you have the select board one? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Dana did them. Uh, I'll tell you what. Um, I'll take in... Uh, I'll take and write one, but I want somebody else to take and uh, proofread it and to uh, add or subtract from it. I'm not real, unless somebody else wants to do the report, I'm just not a real, I'm not a real uh, uh, English major. I Yeah, I mean, I, I can, I can try to take a crack at it if you want, not that my English is going to be any better than yours, but um, I've, I've done them. Uh, in the past, I can usually whip it out in an hour or two, um, and then it'll just, someone's going to have to go through and uh, fix some of my grammar, but uh, yeah. it'll at least give us something, and, and just, you know, just so we're all on the same page, what, I, what I've done in the past historically is kind of talk about the investments we made throughout the year, uh, talk about, you know, uh, the upcoming budget, how we, how we got to it, um, and Kind of leave it at that kind of try to leave it uplifting and positive for the future <laughs> i don't know about i don't know how uplifting budgets are but <laughs> okay well just it's just a you know i just look at it like an overall report not just yeah. a, a budget piece but kind of try to walk them through you know where yeah. we made investments and um, well the, they're just trying to make a give a general walkthrough of where the the town's heading and what direction and yeah and what our and, vision our vis overall vision right 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 and you know a lot of it um you know is has been focused you know at least the past few months on the the town center right and a lot of our discussions have been um around that so um i'll i'll try to get something together by tomorrow and send it out to everyone and uh and you guys can edit the heck out of it. <laughs> Along those Rip same it to lines. Shreds. Yeah. 
Along those same lines, I was going to say I'd be willing to proofread it. And also, have we discussed dedicating the town report as well? No, Flo, there has not been a discussion on that. I think we should discuss that mainly because they're going to need that information as well fairly quickly. And do we want to also um, give feedback as to how many town reports to order this year, or is that Rosemary that would make that decision? We had that, uh, we had that, uh, Rosemary and I had that discussion some time ago. Um, the trouble is you don't want to have too few, but we always have a box or two left over. True. And this year, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think when we took the put the, the reports out to bid, I think there was a number there. There was a number of uh, copies. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're pretty well uh, locked into it now. Okay. But everybody, everybody bid on the number of copies. Okay. Good point. Um, so, so yeah, my, my second piece, um, I, I was a little unclear. We approved the uh, move from a part-time to a full-time assistant clerk position. Did we also, and we talked about um, increasing Rosemary's salary with the overall budget item of both being an additional 25000 did did we do that or not? I I'm, I was just unclear on the rosemary part. You did I, not I, do I, rosemary. Okay. We did. Um, Corin. Right. I believe I made. I I believe I made the motion for the approval of a uh, turn the part time town ed, town clerk assistant town clerk position being made a full-time position i don't feel I, we didn't address the the second item that was on the agenda there so i mean i don't know if we can go brad can we go back to that at this point if we need to oh uh, yes i guess so yeah i mean no reason you can't um so if you want to reopen that discussion um the town uh, under the town court budget. Um, what's your pleasure? I made so, a motion to to increase Rosemary's salary to an even fifty five thousand. I think that's fair based on the discussion we had, and also comparable salaries and the amount of work that she does and her extensive experience. That's my own opinion. I would second that. I just looked at Northfield's town clerk and that's right in line with that as well, Flo. So I would second that. So uh, I, uh, uh, on both of these, are these effective immediately? I, I think Rosemary's is effective with the fiscal year. Okay. I would concur with that. Uh, okay. I agree, I concur. And John, when you're writing the documentation that you're going to put together, I would also include like, changes in personnel, yep. um, appreciation to Dana, and how we really um, sincerely appreciate all of our employees. Um, just everyone's working so hard and diligent on behalf of the town. Yep. And we you, you know appreciate what? It. And Flo, Flo, I'm going to say something that might be a little bit ridiculous, but I think you might appreciate this. I would almost recommend that maybe, I know typically we don't, we, we put the, uh, town report out um for somebody who maybe is retired or no longer with us but I, maybe we could even even dedicate the town report this year to rosemary for all her years of dedication while she's still here in service um, I think well i was thinking more of Tim neighbor. Tim davis senior yeah been a lot of years here with the road. Hi, Rosemary. It's John Quinn. How are you? 
John, you're on, not on mute. Are you watching the meeting or no? No, no, you're not missing much. I've only hit, I've only banged my head. Oh, I've only banged my head against the desk about 30 times. <laughs> John, you're not on mute. Um, I just want to make sure um, I updated you as I said I would, and the board took up both of the the um, recommendations um, that that you request. Okay, Justin, anything for roundtable? Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, I don't know when the decision was made or how it was made. I had uh, about our, our, our uh, town administrator position. I was on the original uh, the hiring committee, and then, then I realized that once the position wasn't filled with the first round, I was removed from it, and I wanted to know when that decision was made and how that was made. Well, when you um, were there, uh, there was one time that you couldn't make it and, and you uh, substituted yourself for John. We just went with that. Right. So I, that, there was one time I did that. So why, why would I be, why would you, why would you have continued on with that? that uh, I'm just curious. That wasn't a board decision. That was your decision. And um, and I'm not calling you out on it, but uh, it sounds like I am, uh, cause I definitely am actually, but I mean, it was the hiring committee's decision. Well, it wasn't the hiring committee's decision to determine the hiring committee. So the hiring committee didn't determine that I shouldn't be on it. So who made the decision? Because it would come to me, but at the same time you took and passed off your responsibilities. I to did not. Person. I never passed off my, my responsibilities. I was not available. So I'm just asking, I, I, I would have let in. And furthermore, I had no outreach on it. So don't you think that that would be something that would warrant some, some uh, communication? So I get emails of people that were interviewing uh, forwarded from another board member that I've been, and I've been removed from the hiring committee that I was originally placed on that was that was the the not the hiring committee the select board opted to have me on and you made the decision to remove me so I find that quite bothersome and I wanted to know I I didn't recall that happening in a, in a select board meeting so I don't know why that would happen just based on uh, an opinion well, the, uh, and I'd like an explanation of it because I certainly didn't shirk any responsibilities that were given to me. I was unable to attend a meeting and that doesn't mean that I'm una unable to uh, fulfill that role. Well, if I can't take in the really, I mean, I have no, I have no uh, uh, real good explanation. The, the only thing I knew is that the, uh, uh, John showed up. Oh, John was on that meeting, and uh, he was at the rest of them. And right, were, right, right. So I was told. But there were several that the after that meeting, there were several others that he was there, but you weren't. I didn't get invites to them because somebody made the decision that I was no longer on that meeting. So why would I attend those if I don't even know they're going to occur? I didn't know you didn't get an invite. Well, I hadn't. So that's what I'm trying to get to the bottom of. I would have absolutely attended them, but I was not privy to the information. I didn't even know when the meetings were happening. So I emailed Tom and asked Tom what the situation was. And he said that you had made the decision on who this new hiring committee was and that I should take it up with you. So that's what I'm asking right now. Well, I'm like I said, I, I, I have, you know, a, the, John had been there and um, so you just assumed that I wasn't going to be on it without communicating with me and just I was left well, I was, off it. I, I so where did the ball was, get dropped? That's what I, I want to know. I want to know where the ball got dropped, where I became removed from this hiring committee that the select board put me on and when I stopped receiving those emails and why I stopped receiving them and why I was no longer a part of it. That's what I want to know. It's just a well, I guess simple I probably question. Dropped the ball then. Okay, that's all I want to know. Yeah. So, 
So you made a decision for the board outside of outside of that. Well, I, outside, I didn't, of our, outside of our meetings where we decided I was going to be on this hiring committee. Yeah. But again, John was there and you worked. Well, I wasn't, I didn't get an invite to it and I wasn't given any of the information when, so how the hell would I even be on it? So yeah. you can go back to that all you want. I don't think anybody's going to dispute how much time anybody puts in there. So oh, no. you can, you can try to, you can tell me that I, John was there and I wasn't. But I think we all know that I put in enough time. The reason I wouldn't have been there would be if I didn't have the information or I was unavailable. And based on the board's decision to have me be a part of it, I don't know where I would get removed because I wasn't at one meeting. So you can go back to that, but that's irrelevant. The, well, the, what the, I, the discussion is why I was dropped off and it bothers me. So because that, that was the decision that the select board made. Uh, yeah. And I'd like, uh, I don't even know. It, it, it just blows my mind and uh, I'll figure out where to go from here, but it blows my mind that that, that happened. And it sounds like it doesn't matter because John was there and I wasn't, is your opinion. Is that correct? Well, the thing of it is, is that the, um, uh, it would have been better if you had just, said you couldn't make the meeting and not send somebody to substitute for you. And I think that's where I got the feeling that you didn't want to uh, do it anymore and that John was willing well, to take your place. I said, you would, I, 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 I remember, and I specifically said John would sit in on that meeting for me because I was unable to attend, but that's fine. I understand if there's, we're going to say there's a communication issue, but moving forward, I mean, why wouldn't I have at least been as an original person involved in that, why wouldn't I have been involved moving forward? I mean, I, it, all of a sudden, once we got to this last position, I am dropped off everything, and now I'm out of the loop. And I, I, I don't feel like that was in the best interest of the town. I mean, I had spent the process. I had gone through the interviews. I had gone through this entire process and voiced my opinions. And and without additional discussion, I would feel that, if, if that's what you were thinking, we would have had additional discussion on it. And I guess maybe at the end of the day, I'm thinking that communication would be a little bit better by this board. I'm thinking that um, if that's what your thought was and you were going to change it and you were going to make these decisions for the board that are the board's decisions to make, that you would have at least reached out and said, hey, is this what's going on? Yeah, I, I don't understand why that happened. I, to me, like that's just not how... Well, I have to apologize then because I made the mistake. Well, I appreciate that. I just it's it, and and moving forward, I'd like to be a part of it because I think it's a it's a huge piece of this town that I've been involved in. Okay, we'll see what we can do. Well, no, we will do that. There, what do you mean? We'll see what we can do. What is there that you will see what we can do? Well, we'll give me some definition on it then. We. We agreed to have two select board members on the hiring committee. If we have three, then it becomes a select board meeting. Well, then it, I don't really know what to tell you because I was on the original thing and you dropped me off it. So I guess we got that problem resolved. Yeah. Well, let me think about it. There's nothing to I think have, about. I'm the original wi the original wishes, your job as the chair of the board is to carry out the wishes of the board. The original board wished to have me on the committee. You made the decision outside of the board to have me off the committee based on what you thought was the process. There's nothing for you to think about. It's simply that I'll be on that committee. Okay. And if that means you don't want to be on it, you want to step down so John can be on it, that's fine. But that's the way, I mean, that's... Wow. You, okay. you, you can't really make that decision either, probably, uh, because it was the original wishes of the board. So, yeah. Okay, well, let me take it under, give us some thought, but uh, I'd be afraid. Uh, I think, John, you're going to be off the committee. I think, I think the, John made a phone call. I, I don't know. I think, I think the board needs to vote on it. <laughs> well, <board>. we'll, put, <laughs> we'll put it on the for the 20th then. <laughs> All right. I mean, I've sat through all the interviews. Yeah. Interviews well, two, for what? Exactly. We've only had two so far. Yeah. 
we've only had the two so far, so that that might be good. You know, so I'm not gonna, um, I'm not running again. Okay, I, I've made that decision. I've been bullied on this board. I've been put in positions that I never needed to be put in. I, I am on disability. I have a very severe disease. I have COVID running around and I'm terrified. I, you know, I've tried to be, I've been on this board for three years. You know, I, and I try not to put myself into positions where I know that I'm not going to um, succeed or be able to live up to the expectation. So, you know, and you guys went ahead and cut my stipend, which, you know, whatever. I sent the rest of it to the, to the, Berlin fire department, <clears throat> but what are you going to do the next time somebody gets sick? What, what is, what are you, what is the board's, what is the board going to do when somebody gets sick and they can't fulfill the obligations or meet expectations? Are you going to punish them? I, that's, I want to know. Well, I don't see what I don't see what can come up now that's going to take and and uh, I mean you can take and do it all the speculation you want, but realistically, until it comes up, you can't say what you're going to do. No, but you ought to have a plan. I'm leaving. I don't give a shit what you guys do. Really, I'm here just because you know. Well, I'm going to finish this out. Period. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Dismissed as always. Thank you. Flo? I don't have anything tonight, but thank you. Uh, anything else? I have nothing. Can I go again? No, no I'm just sure, kidding. Go ahead. I, I wrote a I wrote a message in the uh, chat. I, I I told Rosemary I'd call her and let her know how her budget went, and uh, um, she was very thankful and wanted me to thank the board for her and Corinne, and uh, was very appreciative that we took the time to go over her budget, and uh, even more thankful that we did make adjustments. But just the fact that we went over it, she was she was very happy. So okay, well, that's it. Hey, John, thanks for taking the time to do that. Okay, uh, and uh, a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. <laughs> a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good evening and thank you.